Howe? Here. Councilmember Pamela Stewart? Here. Councilmember Kent Treen? Present. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, I'm gonna have Councilmember Treen do our Pledge of Allegiance. Great, thank you. We're gonna to move to our land acknowledgement statement and I believe Councilmember Howe is going to go for that and do a little preface that we didn't do the first time. Thank you, Mayor. Our land acknowledgement is a statement we read to recognize indigenous peoples who are the original stewards of the lands on which we now live, work, and recreate. The city is a proud partner of the Stoqualmie tribe and we feel it's important to recognize the history and connection tribes have always had to these lands. Therefore, I will now read our statement. We acknowledge that we, are the, that we are on the indigenous land of Coast Salish peoples who have reserved treaty rights to this land, specifically the Stoqualmie Indian tribe. We thank these caretakers of this land who have lived and continue to live here since time immemorial. Great, thank you. Um, next, I'll entertain a motion uh, to approve the agenda. I motion to approve the agenda. Second. All right, moved and seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, 5-0, agenda is approved as written. Um, next we have public comment. Um, I think we have one person that just stepped in. Would you like to make a comment? Awesome. All right, we'll start with in the chambers here and then I'll move it to online. All right, yeah, yeah go all right. ahead. Hi, I'm Miss Dina Ann, Sammamish resident and the director of Trash Equals Cash. I've emailed all of you guys before and introduced myself and said hello. Um, today I'd like to continue to address the pass fail of roadways. Um, Saturday last we had the roundabout road closed at East Lake Sammamish Parkway and the detoured traffic onto Isquah Pine Lake Road was unmanageable. I couldn't make a left turn out of my complex or a right turn as a, uh, for that matter because the road never cleared. Uh, I, could, I had to drive all the way through Klahani and around because the wait was roughly 20 minutes just to get out of, um, uh, onto Isquah Pine Lake Road. It was really bad. Now, understandably, this is not an everyday occurrence, uh, but evidence clearly illustrates any one road closure and Isquah Pine Lake Road is effectively shut down. Considering the addition of the school and the interest of the size of the city center, I don't see how we can have the improvement to Isquah Pine Lake Road set back on the agenda. Uh, there's a bulk of construction, uh, then a clustering of the community that's going to happen on the south end of Sammamish as well as on the north end. I would be very interested to find out where the funds are coming from to pay for the necessary upgrades before Sammamish can handle the influx of more people or even the concentration of people that already live here into these new areas. Areas. This is not prejudice, it's just physics, and is directly related to the quality of life. Kids going to school, grocery shopping, sports attendance, safe wa safely walking our dogs, our daily routines are gonna become much more time consuming. And I don't think you get much better than Sammamish for folks who work from home. So it's not so much that aspect, it's once we're all having to go do our errands. If the density must occur, the infrastructure must be there to support it. And that's all levels of infrastructure, water, abundance of nature, ease of travel within the community, quality food, et cetera. And again, I'd like to raise the idea of impact funds to be used uh, before they expire. I'd like to request the council take the time to explain to the community, such as myself, um, how much money we have in impact funds, um, which I understand is paid for by the developer to create infrastructure so that we don't have issues if the city grows. Um, uh, what language in the scope of the impact fees allows for studies before making improvements or covers improvements in stages? 
Um, we know that we have impact fees that are coming due to either be used or passed back to the developer. And why should we give the money back to the developer when they made plenty of money on developing the space that created the inclusion of more people, hence requiring the use of the impact fees, which are levied against the builder to offset the impact of their construction? And in the same vein, but addressing another issue, I commented on last time, uh, what is our possibility of doing small upgrades continuously? For example, Southeast 47th Way and 238th Way off of Isquah Pine Lake Road is perfect for a roundabout for the daily convenience of everybody who uses it, uh, Isquah Pine Lake Road. The cross lanes are never more than a couple of cars sporadically. The intersection is big enough and a light stopping flow through uh, Isquah Pine Lake is too long. Thank um, you so much. Thank Thanks. you. Yeah. I was almost done. But. Mm -hmm. All right, we'll move on to online. If you wish to provide public comment, please raise your hand. For attendees who are joining by phone, please raise your hand by pressing star nine. Currently have three commenters. I will unmute them in the order they have raised their hands. And please start your comments by stating your name and the city you live in for the record. And there will be a three minute time limit. Mr. Osmer. Mute. Okay, trying to get unmuted. There we go. <clears throat> Good evening, council members. Um, as you know, my name is Dave Osmer, and I live in Providence Point, and I'm the chair of the HOA's Government Affairs Committee. Uh, my comments tonight are regarding uh, your uh, proposed uh, approval of the uh, Transportation Capital Improvements Plan. And as I mentioned in my remarks to you on uh, May 24th, uh, we have great interest in uh, the plans that are contained in this TCIP regarding 228th Avenue Southeast and 40th, Southeast 40th Street. I note that the description of TR 110 has been expanded since the last time I had a chance to see it. It now includes the words intersection and signal, which it didn't before, in addition to frontage improvements and non-motorized improvements as mitigation for school development, unquote. However, there is no accompanying, accompanying increase in the expense, which remains at 3.7 million in the, as it was in the draft TCIP. I remind you again, as I did in my June letter to you, that 3.7 million is totally unrealistic. The improvements by the city of Issaquah to Southeast 43rd, <clears throat> Southeast 43rd Way including included adding a stop signals to, at Providence Point's main entrance as well as frontage and non-motorized improvements. That project was budgeted at 7.9 million. This project, or that, excuse me, that project pales in comparison to the work that will have to be done on 228th to accommodate the school district's proposed massive intrusion. Furthermore, there remains no accompanying proposal for widening 228th north of 40th and extending it beyond uh, uh, Issaquah Pine Lake Road. <clears throat> the district pro project will result in significant increases in congestion on 228th and Southeast 40th and inter uh, Issaquah Pine Lake Road during peak travel times. This will have major adverse impacts on the residents of Sammamish Highlands, as well as Sammamish residents who commute via 228th, and on our residents who currently use that route to access Sammamish businesses. I believe that this expense estimate for TR 110 is, as currently described, is deeply flawed and should be reconsidered prior to your approval of this TCIP. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I will now promote the next commenter.
on my first word. Hello. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Adar Seliker, and I live near the Sammamish Town Center. I'm a 17-year-old rising senior at Skyline High School and a member of Sustainability Ambassadors, an activist organization aimed at rapidly advancing a sustainable future. This year, the year I recognized our extreme need for sustainability was 2017. There were days when we Sammamish residents couldn't step outside because of the smoke from wildfires. This was only exacerbated by the 55-day stretch without rain. These effects of climate change are continuously worsening, impacting all of Washington's ecosystems. According to the EPA, Washington's average snowpack has decreased 20% since 1950 and will likely melt to uh, three to four weeks earlier than it does now by 2050. I care about sustainability because it is the only way to ensure the protection of Earth's ecosystems and the maintenance of the quality of life for our generation and future generations. Membership in Sustainability Ambassadors has helped me advance sustainability by giving me a group that I can work with to both teach others about why we need sustainability and ways we can be more sustainable. Thank you for your past work on integrating an environment and conservation section into the current Sammamish Comprehensive Plan. It's convenient that we have a plan to make Sammamish a more sustainable city, but it is crucial that we move farther than that. One of today's agenda items is an amendment to the Bluma Environmental Impact uh, Statement. While it is a step forward to such an impact statement to shape the 2024 Sammamish Comprehensive Plan, the current Comprehensive Plan does little to ensure that we are making progress and moving towards a sustainable Sammamish. The policies set in the Environment and Conservation section are extremely vague, and progress made based on each policy is very difficult to measure quantitatively. We need a climate action plan, a detailed framework for the reduction of carbon emissions in our city. Iskwal has one, Kirkland has one, Redmond has one, and so does Newcastle. So why don't we? As we implement actions to address climate change, it also brings other benefits, such as cleaner air, less asthma, lower energy costs because of efficiency, easier ways to move around the city, and green jobs. We ask that the council initiate the construction of a climate action plan. Thank you. Thank you so much. I will now promote the third commenter. And we do have a fourth commenter, so there will be another one after this. Lena? Hi, may I begin? Yes, go ahead. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Lena Joy Bartman, and I've lived in Trossex for nine years. I'm 16 and a rising senior at Skyland High School. I'm a member of, Samam of the Sammamish team at Sustainability Ambassadors, which is an organization focused on leading real change in the goal of building a sustainable future. I care about sustainability because I want to play a role in helping to protect our ecological systems and lead sustainability for future generations. Being a part of Sustainability Ambassadors has allowed me to learn about different actions that can be taken to forward sustainability, which I've observed in the steps that other Washington cities are taking. Seeing these actions and then considering my local area, I found that Sammamish is lacking in a lot of these areas and I'd like to see that change. I believe we can also become a model city in the environmental aspects. First, I'd like to thank you all for your previous work on the Sustainability Master Plan from 2011, and I'm glad that we're taking some first steps at an effort to improve sustainability. However, one specific area I'd like to focus on today is the public transportation in Sammamish. In my own past experience, I found it difficult to access modes of public transport for my residents in Sammamish. My peers and I have often planned to take sound transit on our trips to Seattle or UW so that we could reduce carbon emissions, but we found it slightly ironic that in order to reach one of those bus stops in a timely manner, we had to be driven there using personal vehicles anyways. I've taken a look at the TCIP, the transport segment of the Sammamish Comprehensive Plan, and while I was glad that, to see that sustainability was being addressed, I found that a lot of the policies are worded very vaguely and aren't very specific. Take poli policy T218, for example, which states that, quote, new development in the city should be designed to provide and encourage non-motorized access to transit where appropriate. While accessibility to public transport is being addressed here, the policy is very brief, passive, and doesn't enforce any specific regulations. 
It feels more like a suggestion than enforcing any actual change that, was, that would maximize sustainability. This leads me to my main point today, which is the lack of a climate action plan in Sammamish. In order to implement actual change, we need a plan that will effectively improve aspects of our city, such as the available tra public transport within Sammamish. Easier ways to move about the city and travel to others brings many benefits, such as cleaner air with less carbon emissions, just to name one. In closing, we ask that the council initiate the construction of a climate action plan. Thank you. Thank you so much. I will now promote the fourth caller. Mary Wichter. Hi, this is Mary Wichter. I've been in Sammamish 20 years. I just wanted to speak briefly on a couple items you have tonight. On the consent agenda, I do see you have the source control systems um, contract services. Those are required by NPDES. I'm glad to see that the city has them. They know about them. I think you've selected a fine consultant for doing those. And then um, I think in past discussion, you had said maybe they could do it at a little bit more expedient pace rather than just 20 per year, but I think you should start off with the, what you have, get it set up for the first year and then see how things go. Um, on the second item, the hearing examiner selection under new business 14, um, I'm not familiar with one of the parties, but I can tell you that John Galt has been a hearing examiner for the city of Sammamish and has done a very fine and excellent job very professionally over the years. I've seen him in person three days on the East Lake Sammamish Trail, listening to over 8,000 pages of input and people speaking for those three days. I've seen him on individual uh, public hearings for people that um, were appealing something that the city had decided on. I've seen him work on things where the city had made a ruling and someone was appealing against that in the hearing examiner and those have gone on and been supported by uh, the courts above. So I think he does an excellent job. I think his costs are known. He's a known entity. And I just wanted to put that in because I, I feel like he served the city of Sammamish very well. And I know that his contract was up this year. It's been extended to September and then it would renew for another four years if you so choose. And then the last item is uh, the number 12 for the TCIP. Uh, I do believe that the last TIP, as it was called, um, was adopted in 2019. I believe it is supposed to be adopted every year by cities. Um, and I believe that it's supposed to be done, I think, by the end of July, but I'm not sure on the date there. But I know that when you adopt it, then it is possible and easier to um, apply for TIB grants from the TIB board. And since we have so many projects and so many things worthwhile doing, I think being able to get uh, TCIP passed um, as well as you can with the current council um, so that any, any and all grant monies could be applied for um, to help out any projects that they would be able to apply to. And I really appreciate all the staff that the city has and the things that they do in supporting uh, those, including writing grants. And as you need to reach out to public individuals or groups to support, please do so because that does help you get grant monies. Thank you. Thank you. We do have another commenter, so I will promote him. All right, thank you. Mr. Stickney. Good evening, city council members. Paul Stickney, Sammamish. I didn't um, um, a plan on a comment tonight, but hearing some of the speakers, I thought of a few things that I think would be um, helpful. I agree that there are issues in Sammamish, especially when there are traffic uh, blockages or things that we don't expect, certain arterials can definitely get uh, backed up. I agree. But I would point out the uh, nexus of uh, fairness, if you will, for who is supposed to pay for, for the projects. I would suggest the city take a look back at the 2003 comprehensive plan and the comprehensive plan that was adopted in October of 2015. In those two plans, there were many, many committed transportation projects that had those been done, I would assert that we would have much less uh, traffic and much time and thought went into those to determine what part was 
on our community at the time to pay the cost for, and then what parts are for future development that was added. And I would just advise analyzing that in your assessment of future uh, TIPs. Um, real kudos to the um, sustainability ambassadors that showed up. Back in, was it 2017 or 16? I think Pam Stewart was there, maybe Karen Howe and a few others. There was a um, sustainability summit. And one of the images that they used was a, a sustainability sandwich. I just searched my Mac and I found that. And on the lower piece of, uh, of the uh, bread, they had equity, environment, and economy. On the top part of the bread, they had a, a climate change. And in the middle, they had sustainability systems. I'd like to suggest that gets changed somewhat. Leave the top piece of bread as climate change. Make the lower piece of bread land use and put sustainable systems and equity, economy, and environment in all the goodies in the middle. That's my comment for tonight. Have a great meeting. Thank you. I do not see any other commenters. Back to you, Mayor. Okay, great. I'm not sure <laughs> if the uh, person in the back that joined us, if that's for public comment. Would you like to make a comment? Oh, great. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Thank you. <laughs> All right, I think we are good there then. So next we have executive session to discuss qualifications of uh, an applicant applicants to elected office pursuant to RCW 42.30.1101H and potential litigation pursuant to RCW 42.30.1101I. Can we start with 20 minutes or you think? I think 20 minutes is sufficient and I'm not sure if council even wants the first reasons stated to discuss qualifications. It's up to council. Let's go for 20 minutes. I think we'll keep both. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Thank you. And so no, no action be... is expected on that after. Okay. Perfect. Um, if I can do the math, what time would we be back? 712? Yeah. 712. Thank you. The council has extended the executive session to 7.30 p.m. I think I'm still muted though. All right, so next we are gonna move to consent calendar um, and I will entertain a motion for approval. I motion to approve the consent calendar. Second. Whoops, I shut this off. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, by 5-0, consent calendar is passed. Um, next, I believe we have presentations and proclamations. So first um, up, I think we're talking about the selection of the council vacancy applicants for position two and three. So I think I'll open it up for discussion unless you had anything. Um, only if you wanted to see the list of the council member or of the applicants. Otherwise, I'll just let you um, move forward with that. Perfect. All right, so I think we'll uh, open it up to offer ideas for the process or for nominations, I guess, for who. Council Member Stewart. Um, so uh, I... I think it would, with two positions opened, I think it makes sense for us to consider all eight applicants. And I guess the only real question is, do we feel like we need to re-interview the three folks who've already interviewed? We can obviously go back and watch the, the video of their interviews already, uh, and we do have their applications. So to me, that's, the, that's one question from a process perspective, whether it's five or eight that we're interviewing, that's still gonna be time consuming, so my recommendation would be that we put hardcore time constraints on, uh, you know, like a three minute intro or a two minute intro and then, you know, three minute answers for however many questions we wanna ask if we wanna ask three 
ish questions so that we can get through all of the interviews in a reasonable amount of time. So those would be my recommendations. Cool. Yeah, I like that. Council Member Howe? I would look forward to interviewing all of them, even though we have heard them from them before. I do think that because some of these folks have um, applied a second time, and I I feel like we should talk to them. I mean, I really feel like we, we need, this is a perfect opportunity to get to know them better. Um, and they've had an opportunity to understand, and I hope, you know, study just other people's interviews and, um, of course, attend or study our council meetings and are able to bring a richer, uh, you know, presentation about themselves forward and not, the, and not regurgitate. I'd be very disappointed if people said the same things that they'd said before. So, um, I, but I, I just think it's a great opportunity and I, I'm excited. I'm, I'm really looking forward to this process. But I also agree to the time restraints. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, agreed. Deputy Mary Lamb? I think we should interview all of them. I think it levels the playing field more because we may not remember exactly what they said and you know they'll be on video versus being in person. I, th I just think it's just more fair to have them all interview at the same time in the same process. I also agree that we should limit their their responses just because it would it would take quite a long time to if if they spent a really long time with the responses. All right, Councilmember Treen. Yeah, I concur with uh, Councilmember Lamb, and and I think one of the ideas I would have to help with the time, they they've already answered three questions. So if we could actually limit the interview to one question uh, for a two to three minute answer. Um, I think at that point we'd have a pretty good idea um, of who, who the candidates are that we would like to select and have uh, sit on the council. So that would be my suggestion as uh, do all eight and then just limit our question to one. Thank you. Um, I'll take one moment, yeah. And I didn't know, just for clarification, if that was one, um, I know we already submitted a list of questions to our city clerk and then the top three that were voted on were what was sent out for the interview. So if we would do something from there, what you were thinking? Yeah, uh, probably right off the list that we've already submitted, we could grab one of those questions just to kind of finish it off. Cool. Yeah, so I agree. I would love to interview all eight, um, even the three that we already have. Um, I think I'd like to see maybe two questions instead of just the one. Um, and then I do like the time limits and having that two minute intro as well. Councilmember Stewart. Yeah, um, I like the idea of three. I mean, I just, I did the math. So if we did three questions at three minutes plus a two minute intro and a minute or two to shuffle back and forth, we can do it in about 15 minutes per person, which would be two hours um, to do eight people, which I think is is reasonable and I do think having three additional questions, again, with two people, right, two more positions to fill, it feels pretty big and important, so I wouldn't mind seeing that. Um, I'd also like to propose that we do it like we used to do when we had in person for the commissioners where they're all here and then we take everybody out who's not being interviewed into like the conference room so they're not watching, so we can't ask the same question and people who go later don't have an advantage. Um, especially since it's you know time constrained, um, I wouldn't want to give the people who go last an advantage over the people who went first type of thing. So that would be my recommendation, and I'd love for us to kind of take the remaining questions and maybe do like a stacked rank voting on them, and then take the top three from that or something like that. So are you expecting uh, all the all the applicants to be here in person? Um, I think we need that. Um, for a number of reasons, unless they have, you know, a medical reason or something not to be, I, I, I would like to propose that we require them to be here, um, in part because of part of the process that has to occur. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, for that, because if we appoint that evening, they'll have to basically come right up. Yep. Um, yeah. Did you have? No, that, that I was going to say. Um, I don't know if we want to share uh, with the public what the requirement is at this time. I'm kind of looking over to the city manager and the city attorney if we want to share that part of the RCW. 
certainly we can share the part about the newly appointed person who fills the um, the sixth seat, if you will, will then be part of the council that helps appoint the seventh person, the final vacancy. Right, so I think we do want to uh, have them be here unless there is a very, very, very good reason why they can't be, so. All right, so as far as clarification for one to three questions, what do you all think? I mean, it, unless anyone has a different idea, I do like the idea of just submitting like our top ones back to our city clerk. Um, Council Member Treen. Yeah, so. Thanks, Council Member Stewart. Uh, if the sixth seat is filled and then is gonna make a decision on the next council, person it, it would kind of be smart for them for all of them to hear the testimony how would i vote I, i'm just trying to think it through like i would I, personally i would be like how do i vote for somebody if i haven't if i don't know who they are myself so, so i didn't know that rule so thank you for reading that and so i, I think you're have them in person and have them here and i guess we just have to draw straws to make it fair as to who goes first and then if that's the case, and I, I really do think then we do limit this to one or two questions, mm -hmm. right? Because then you could do a serpentine where you go start with number one, go through to eight, then turn around second question, boom, shoot it down. You got a, you got a shot at. So that would be just a suggestion. And I agree, take, you know, figure out which one's on the list and pick them. Thanks. Yeah, I agree, kind of like forum style. So start with the first and then, um, so I'm good with two questions. Is there, I don't know if you want like a majority that wants three questions or um, if there's any other thoughts. Council Member Howe. I have a question I think about that second appointment then. I wonder if if it's truly fair to, to ask that new appointee to make such a quick turnaround and determination is it possible for to to delay their vote until the following week? This I don't know how to. I just. I hate the idea that we're not giving ample time and consideration to this import to both important roles, and I don't want to disadvantage the new person by pressuring them, um, and and to give them the, the the opportunity and the benefit of of the extra. Um, insight or e even if it was something that we voted on at the end of the meeting so that they had a time a chance to review mm -hmm. everyone's uh, you know written uh, responses for example and to, to give it fair and just c consideration I don't know unless That's we do that first I, I was wondering Councilmember Stewart yeah I mean it's a it's a great question I do think though that the packets are out for the public, right? So everybody has access to everyone's applications right now already. So I think maybe just notifying people that the first person appointed will have to make that determination at some point, whether it's immediately following them sitting down or at the end of the meeting. Um, but my recommendation would be to get them both appointed because if you wait another week when that person gets appointed, they don't have the benefit of any questions that come up before the agenda and things like that. So it, either way, some, it, I mean, it's, it's, an, it's a not perfect situation, but I would say, you know, just letting the eight applicants know that that's what's gonna happen and they should be prepared. <laughs> Did you have something, Scott? No, uh, thank you, Mayor. I was just gonna point out that um, whatever you decide to do, our presumption is that you're gonna want to swear in and seat those council members immediately afterwards. So I would suggest however you do it, you do it all at once so that there's no delay uh, because we're gonna be asking them to either, either weigh in on or potentially vote depending on the meeting um, that evening. And so I just wanna make sure that if we're gonna do it, we do it all together. Yeah, so maybe um, instructions back to all eight could just include 
please familiarize with your fellow applicants, um, as you'll be. And did is it true that it'd be um, Mayor Malchow's position first, like f per resignation, which came in first, or just another layer? Maybe we need to figure out. I think you could do it that way. I don't know that there's a requirement to do it that way. Okay. I think you know the one thing you may, um, both positions have to be up for re-election at the same, the same election. Mm -hmm. uh, even though one is, if they get elected, would then fill the rest of that remaining term, and one would actually be up for election. So, that's the only difference between the two seats, and you can decide how you want to do that. Okay, um, great. Uh, Deputy Mayor Lamb. I just wanted to be clear on the process. So we're gonna seat one, a new council member, and that person is gonna to have to decide on the next council person, all of us. And this person is gonna to have to decide because he or she isn't gonna hear any of the interviews from the other candidates. He, he or she's gonna to have to decide based on the three predetermined, the, the questions from the application. Is that correct? Yeah, Carrie. I just wanted to add that um, while there is no set prescribed process for how to do this, um, it is noted in the MRC page about how to fill a council vacancy. The legislative body can ask candidates to voluntarily leave the room while other candidates are being interviewed, but since it's an open public meeting, the other candidates cannot be required to leave. Mm -hmm. And so I just think that your idea of going switchback yeah. style where the first person's asked first and then gets asked last okay. in the second round makes sense, mm -hmm. um, but they can't be required to leave. Okay. That's helpful. All right, two or three questions, what y'all think? <laughs> two, two, three, three, two, two. Oh, I think we have it. three. Yeah, so three people said two questions, two people said three questions. So we'll do the top two questions. Um, yeah, if you don't mind sending that again, because I did it, but yeah. And then I don't think we'll be posting what those are until the day of, right? Go ahead, Scott. Uh, no, thank you, Mayor. I was going to say we will we will get that sent out to all of you. You can we'll send it in back into Lita, and then we'll tabulate it, and then have those ready for you at the meeting, um, so that everyone's on the same level playing field from that perspective. If that makes sense, Lita. That, yeah, that's fine. Um, I have one other question. Will these questions be only read or made public during the uh, interviews, or you or will they be getting them ahead of time? Interviews. Okay. And then that's the meeting that starts at 5.30, right? That's, Next that's week. correct. Yes. yes, just to make sure, cool. And then, and then just so we're clear, we'll, we will pause in between once you select the first candidate, Lita will swear them in, we'll seat them, get them sort of their laptop up and ready to go, and then you can do the second one after that and we'll do the same thing again. All right, is there any other, uh, Deputy Mayor Lamb? I don't know if this makes it more fair or less fair. If you, I was just thinking about what you're saying, Carrie, that if you go down the line and then you go back down the line the other way, then somebody in the middle, you know, they get the same amount of time to think. So what if they just drew numbers? Like, then it's totally random. Okay. I'm good either way. Yeah. Okay, let's just keep it as is then. They can get random numbers. Okay. Like seating. Okay. <laughs> cool. All right, hopefully that is clear. <laughs> we, if you really want us to, we could get like a small box with the numbers and everybody could have their number and then you just pull a number out each each round and do them that, in that order. No, and I, then that way it's just But totally then the same person could get to go last both times, so. That's, yeah, let's draw the numbers. Okay. Both Sounds times. perfect. Both yeah, times? absolutely. Yeah. I think yeah. it's very random. That way it's completely random and there's no... There's and no it's one, more fun. No, <laughs> no one has a competitive <laughs> We're going to do it like a... Bi I want the bingo thing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Councilmember Stewart, did you have... Yes, yeah. actually, um, I did want us to also clarify how we're going to vote um, so that that is not something that is random. Like, I would prefer that we have the, the spreadsheets printed out with the eight people on it and we all vote and if somebody gets four 
or five, because those are the only two options, then they win. And then if that doesn't work, then what is our plan B for getting, so we, for the first person, right, we would do that. Um, if nobody gets four or five, then, then what do we do? And let's figure that out now and not next week. I think one of the issues we had when we did it, your first suggestion was that if we went in the order of the council, the last person to choose got no, I like the idea of you give us a printout oh, and we okay. write it down like, again, okay. like so we used to do. So we write it down and then we uh, hand it to you and, and then, then we tally the it up on the board so that nobody's seeing okay. what everybody else is doing. I think I that's see. the okay. I think ultimately the question would be whether or not you want um, transparency overall about how you vote. I think that's why we move to doing someone making a motion and then voting on that candidate. I, I guess I'm good either way. I just want us to know what the what it's going to be. And we could put our names on it, and then you can reveal who and how we voted, if that helps. I, we, I we have to. There's no yeah. secret balloting. Yeah. So as long as everyone knows that their votes will be made public. That's the way we used to do the... the or we can just email it instead no, of... No, no. We, we used to do it for the commissions, and when Lita puts it up, there'll be rows for each of our names. So she'll show who voted for whom. So there's no secret balloting. It's just that we don't see each other's votes beforehand, but we can do the have a motion and then vote on that. That works too. Again, I just want us to have the process down before we get to next week. I'll have each ballot labeled with your name on it. And then when they're collected, we can scan them and have them available in our uh, document center for, for the meeting. So everybody can see the, how we have everybody voted. Is that good enough, Carrie? Is it possible to publish it in real time? That would be better. I'd ha well, I'd have to scan them and then, yeah, I, I'll, I'll. Or could you enter in a spreadsheet that That's you're presenting? You do, right? yeah. I would do that yeah. on the screen with the results of each yeah. ballot. Yeah, if you good. do it on the screen with yes. the results, then it is published in real time. Everyone can see it yes. and that's fine. Yeah. I just want to make that's sure the that. final step, yes. Exactly, that okay. everyone's aware of who voted for which candidate. So do you guys prefer that or do you prefer just make a motion? Have I'm good like with the ballots. Yeah. I'm good with the okay. ballots. I also think we definitely need to write this down so we never have to think about this again. <laughs> Councilmember Treen. <laughs> well, maybe I think my comment might be uh, moot because, but the first person being elected at least would have to get three votes mm -hmm. to, to take the seat and then the, the, the next one would have to get four votes for each. So you need four votes for each. Okay. Clap. Yeah, it has, okay, it has to be a majority of the body, regardless of how many people are here or seated. Thank you for that clarification. So four votes it is. Okay. <laughs> do you have all that? <laughs> yes, I believe I do. I okay. have most of that. Can we watch it? Let's I hate to, to bring this up, but yeah. I, I really want us to have the plan B nailed. So if for some reason a person doesn't get four votes, do we do a second ballot or do we have some other method where we just start going down and voting on people? Like, I think we need to have all of that worked out before we get to next week. I'd say motion from the floor is my vote for that. Okay. Uh, if, if, the, if somebody doesn't get four votes, I'd say motion from the floor as the second. Got it, okay. Does that sound all right? Cool. Whew. All right, next, Sammamish Youth Board. Uh, letter regarding the removal of the Lower Snake River dams. So I believe Anjali, Chris are probably online. All right, Chris, I think you're up. Okay, good evening, Council. Um, 
So tonight, um, the leadership of the youth board is returning in front of council to seek the approval of sign off on a letter advocating for the removal of Lower Snake River Dam and a replacement with clean energy alternatives. There are studies to support both sides of the discussion in keeping and removing these dams. The SYB has attempted to address the concerns raised by, by council in the agenda packet. Public comment period ends on July 11th, and so the SYB is looking for council to either endorse the position of the SYB or to allow them to sign the letter with a note stating the council has declined to act on this recommendation and thereby does, endo does not endorse the position taken by the SNAMS Youth Board. Um, tonight, I do have Monit, our Youth Board Chair. He uh, was our chair last year and was recently voted for our 2022 and 2023 Youth Board. And now I'd like to pass it over to him. Thanks, Chris. Uh, yeah, before I hop into the presentation, Chris, um, I just wanted to clarify, do you want me to screen share or do you want to screen share the PowerPoint yourself? You're muted, Chris. No, if you can share it, then you okay. can click over. That'd be great. Thank yeah. you. Perfect. Then I will do that. Okay, can everyone see my screen? Yeah, okay, cool. Um, yeah, hi everyone, my name is Mamet. As Chris said, I am here on behalf of the Sammamish Youth Board today, once again asking for approval from the City Council uh, for the Sammamish Youth Board to sign off on an original letter advocating for the removal of four dams in southeastern Washington on the Lower Snake River. So uh, just to clarify, you know, what exactly it is we're looking for today, uh, we are looking for approval for this mem sheet board to uh, sign on to an original letter, so a letter that we ourselves drafted up, representing the views of the Sammamish Youth Board advocating for the removal and replacement of these four dams in the Lower Snake River in southeastern Washington. Again, a point that we want to make clear is that we're not just advocating for the removal of these four dams. We do also, in our letter, acknowledge that these dams do provide a lot of benefits for their communities in uh, southeastern Washington, whether that's irrigation, transportation, and of course, producing renewable energy. Um, our main argument here is that uh, the dams at present are uh, having effects on salmon that are simply unacceptable in that uh, they, studies have repeatedly tied them to a strong decline in uh, Pacific Northwest Chinook salmon on the Snake River. So because of that, we feel that it's non-negotiable that the dam should be taken down, but uh, we are in our letter asking for full replacement of the benefits provided by the dams. The second thing that we wanted to highlight uh, this time around is um, just to clear up any uh, miscommunications we may, may have had uh, last time around in January, is that the goal of this presentation is not to convince the council of a solution to the issue. So we're not trying to convince the city council that, in fact, removing the dams is the best option, um, though, of course, we will be going over some of that data that led to our decision uh, throughout this presentation. But really, the main thing we're asking for here is for approval to represent our own independent unanimous views on this topic um, by signing off on our letter. So if, again, just just to make that um, distinction really clear, we're not asking the city council to sign on to this letter. We're asking for permission for we as the Sammamish Youth Board to ourselves sign off on our letter. Um, and again, I do want to point out that uh, the Sammamish Youth Board did vote on this letter as far back as November. And in fact, uh, it was unanimously decided on that we should uh, have this particular stance on this issue. So we're asking to represent our unanimous views. So now just some uh, context and summarizing what the issue actually is. Um, so again, here on the screen, I have a map of Washington, of course, and uh, a little bit of Oregon and Idaho. And as you can see in the bottom uh, right of your screen, um, the four dams on the Lower Snake River are, of course, the Ice Harbor Dam, the Lower Monumental Dam, the Little Goose Dam, and the Lower Granite Dam. These four dams, in particular, they do produce hydroelectricity for the Pacific Northwest, and a lot of their excess energy is shipped off to other regions. So, of course, we recognize that renewable energy is critical uh, to, to Washington state, as well as the United States as a whole, moving forward to meet our climate goals. Um, however, our main concern here is that these four dams in particular, as opposed to other dams, for example, on the Columbia River or on other rivers, is that these four dams are uh, bordering critical salmon habitat uh, just east of these four dams. So um, as Washington starts you know, progressing over to Idaho, um, a lot of Chinook salmon, as well as other species like steelhead, uh, do spawn in those areas, meaning you know, that, that's where they're born. And every year, these salmon uh, go out to the Pacific as they mature into adults. And then, of course, as they come back to reproduce, they have to come all the way back upstream to the same place that they were born uh, to respawn the next generation. So because of that, they have to pass these four dams uh, twice. But 
Another distinction I want to make clear and a common misunderstanding about these dams is that uh, the main problem about salmon is that they can't pass the dams or that, you know, the turbines are chopping them up or something. Um, that's not the case because otherwise, of course, we would have the same problem with all the other dams in the region. Uh, the main problem with these four dams is that, uh, first of all, they're right next to critical salmon habitat. And because of that, when these dams create reservoirs uh, where there used to be a flowing river, that can cause things like, of course, stagnant water, which can lead to things, lead to things like higher water temperatures, which can be ultimately fatal for a lot of salmon, um, because a lot of salmon in the Snake River are very sensitive to water conditions. So rising water temperatures, if the water is stagnant, that means that juvenile salmon have to actively expend energy to swim downstream to the Pacific, when otherwise they would just be carried that way. So that means they have less energy to survive predators. Um, the main point we're trying to make here is there's a lot of different factors which get exacerbated by the presence of these dams in critical salmon habitat um, that are preventing uh, salmon survival and salmon recovery. So just to outline and summarize, you know, what are the main bullet points that we as the Salmon Chief Board care about when it comes to this issue? Um, of course, the first premise is that these dams have been tied to um, Snake River salmon decline over the past few decades, ever since they were put in place. And we do have some data to back that up in our next few slides. Um, and of course, following up from that, there's rippling effects throughout the entire Pacific Northwest, not just in Washington State. Um, one in particular is that uh, salmon decline is disproportionately impacting indigenous communities across the Columbia Basin, such as the Nez Perce tribe and the Umatilla tribe down in Oregon. Um, and first of all, even before we get into the whole treaties thing, this is very important because uh, these salmon have been here for tens of thousands of years. And a lot of indigenous communities in the Columbia Basin have been here and relied on these salmon and their importance to the ecosystems for a very long time. And because of that, a lot of these salmon are very culturally important to a lot of these indigenous communities, and they'll be the most affected if these salmon uh, go extinct. So we want to make sure that we're standing in solidarity with indigenous tribes um, who are doing their best to make sure that these salmon do not go extinct. Um, and the second thing that we want to uh, highlight here in relation to indigenous communities and how they're affected by this issue is that the United States, as far back as 1855, the federal government made treaties with a lot of these indigenous communities, uh, saying that in exchange for these communities ceding millions of acres of land to the United States government, uh, they would be able to retain their rights to fishing and hunting to certain amounts um, on the Snake River, just as they had you know, for centuries before. Uh, however, of course, if dams built by the U.S. government, as these four Snake River dams are, if these four dams uh, result in salmon decline and eventually extinction, um, this will be violating treaties set by the United States government, because, of course, these uh, com indigenous communities cannot retain their right to fish if there's no fish left to catch. Um, and the third thing we want to point out, uh, that one of the biggest reasons why the Salmon Sheath Board is taking such a keen interest in this issue is that these salmon are a keystone species in the Pacific Northwest. This means that uh, they're similar to a keystone in a building's foundation. If these salmon are taken out of um, all the different food chains they intersect, um, a lot of other food webs will collapse on top of them because they're so integral. Um, 137 species, to be exact, across the Northwest rely directly on these salmon, including our endangered southern resident orcas, of which there are only 70-something left. Um, um, so the ecosystem aspect is a big part of this. Again, just summarizing why we're connecting the dams to this. Uh, here is, you know, just to oversimplify everything, um, Washington needs clean energy. We agree on that. Everyone agrees on that. No argument there. Um, the thing where we start to differ uh, from the opposition on is that the hydroelectric dams on the Lower Snake River, those four dams, claim to be clean energy, but they're coming at the cost of the keystone species of Chinook salmon. So our argument here is that energy, even if it's renewable, at the cost of these Chinook salmon cannot be considered clean. And therefore, we're demanding truly clean renewable energy alternatives, whether that's dams in other areas, whether that's ideally things like wind, solar, uh, to replace these. So what's some context around the issue? Of course, uh, it's not just, you know, the Sammamish Sheath Board advocating for dam removal out of the entire Pacific Northwest, um, but rather this is something that is actually under active consideration by the Washington government and our government representatives. Um, in fact, uh, Governor Inslee and Senator Murray uh, recently released a uh, report on June 9th uh, stating a uh, cost of benefit analysis of removal of the Snake River dams, sort of seeing, you know, how feasible is this? Uh, what are the impacts it'll have on salmon? And this report released on June 9th, which you can find at lsrdoptions.org, um, this, this report released by Inslee and Murray's offices did find that um, Snake River Dam removal and replacement is completely feasible and it is affordable as well. Um, and I'll be getting to the exact numbers on a later slide. Um, but this study was very important because it showed that, first of all, there is uh, government support. The government is looking into this. It's not a super avant-garde idea. It has been considered for many decades, but now it's really at the forefront of the discussion because of the science. 
Um, the other thing we want to highlight, as Chris mentioned earlier, um, along with releasing this report on June 9th, uh, Inslee and Murray's offices um, also opened a public comment period for anyone in Washington or even outside of Washington um, who is affected by these dams in some way uh, to comment on whether they want the dams to be removed, how they want to help salmon on the Snake River. And these public comments will be very important in uh, coming up with their Murray and Inslee's official recommendations for what should be done with the Snake River. Um, this comment period is open until July 11th, which is why this is a very time sensitive issue and we want to make sure that the Sammamish Sheet Board gets our voices in um, on time for them to uh, be taken into consideration. Um, and then context on, you know, what's next after this. After taking in these public comments, Governor Inslee and Senator Murray are expecting to release their final recommendations uh, regarding whether to take the dam center or not um, by the end of July. So that's sort of what we're looking forward to right now. Now, just getting to a couple slides of data. Uh, of course, you don't want to overwhelm any of you. It is like 8 p.m. on a Tuesday. But uh, this data, what's important to see here is that um, there's a general decline in these uh, blue bars that you can see throughout the screen. So what do these blue bars mean? Um, these are basically salmon population counts and estimates uh, dating back from the 1950s all the way to the present. Uh, this graph is from February 19th, 2021. So there was a steady decline in the salmon for a multitude of factors, even before the dams were put in place um, for recent such as um, overfishing and uh, a lack of regulations on that. A lot of these regulations went to a, into effect around the same decade that the dams were put in place, so in the 1970s, as you can see here. Um, so because of that, they were no longer as much of a factor. However, after the dams were put in place, you can see that uh, the salmon decline continued, and uh, it, it stabilized at a very, very low number, around 10,000 um, in yearly returns. Of course, another thing to point out, a slight nuance here, is that um, salmon did recover uh, a little bit uh, in the early 2000s because of um, the implementation of new technologies such as fish ladders, fish passages, but even that was not enough to uh, bring these salmon back to their original state. Many studies have shown that uh, unless the dams are removed, there is a very low chance of uh, salmon survival because simply right now there's not enough salmon uh, returning to reproduce each year to sustain the population. That's why it's declining so fast. So until we get up to that level where it's a stable population, there's really no chance of salmon recovery. Um, the report by Senator uh, Murray and Governor Inslee's offices did find that removing the dams uh, is estimated, in a conservative estimate, is that uh, it would increase salmon catch by indigenous communities on the Snake River by up to 29%. And again, that is a conservative estimate by the official offices of Senator Murray and Governor Inslee. Uh, the other two bars here that we, I want to point out is the minimum abundance delisting and escapement goal. So. The bottom bar, minimum abundance delisting, is basically the amount of wild salmon that are necessary to delist them from things like probably the endangered species list. Um, while up here, the escapement goal is basically at what point are these species are like a completely stable species, they no longer need human intervention. So as you can see, we're very far away from the escapement goal, but we are, um, by taking down the dams, we're hoping to get up to the minimum abundance delisting. The dams alone are not, removing the dams alone is not going to save the salmon, but it's the biggest step we can take in that direction. And then a slightly simpler graph that I, I wanted to show you guys is, um, of course, a graph dictating historical and uh, present Chinook salmon abundances in different areas around the Northwest. Um, so the, obviously, the first thing that stands out here is the Columbia River used to have much, much, much more salmon than all these other runs. And because of that, a lot of species evolved to rely on these uh, Columbia River salmon. For example, the southern resident orcas, as you guys are probably familiar with, they're the ones who live up in the Puget Sound, Salish Sea area, um, between the Olympic Peninsula and Seattle. Um, and there's only 70 something of them left, right? So it's a very low number. They're uh, very close to extinction. And these, uh, these orca, 80% of their diet is Chinook salmon. That means that every year, every spring, they migrate all the way down to the mouth of the Columbia River just to feed on these salmon from the Snake River because there's simply not enough salmon in other locations to make up for it. Um, so the historical estimate is also being used in this graph to show um, the very big discrepancy between how many salmon there used to be on the Columbia River and uh, the present run size. As you can see, it's a much larger gap than is present in any of these other, um, other areas. And salmon decline, it's important to note, has happened across the Pacific Northwest, but in the Snake River specifically, um, we've seen a much, much larger uh, decline in salmon and also a lack of recovery after things like fish passages and fish ladders because the dams are in such a critical uh, habitat. And then one last graph that I wanted to, or not graph, one last diagram I wanted to go through real quick is showing, you know, just how uh, how big the impacts of these dams have been on salmon and indigenous communities that are reliant on them. Um, so there's a lot of colors on here, but the main things I want to point out is that 
uh, these light red areas are salmon habitat that has been directly blocked by dams. This is not just the Snake River dams, but uh, it is really showing the impact of hydroelectric dams on the region as a whole. So, of course, dams as a whole have had a large impact on salmon. But one thing in particular is that the four uh, dams on the Snake River are specifically uh, very close to many of these indigenous communities, such as the Nez Perce and uh, the Umatilla down here. So because of that, uh, when these salmon are facing direct impacts from the, uh, from the Snake River, it's these communities that are first affected and most disproportionate proportionately affected. And now one thing that uh, one concern the city council members had in our uh, thing in January was that it, we may not have addressed opposition as clearly as we could. So we wanted to make sure that we're covering that in this meeting. Um, so of course, uh, this isn't like a very black and white issue. Um, there are a lot of factors that go into, you know, why do we still have the dams? And um, surely the dams do produce good for our region. And all of these points are true. Um, one thing that we do want to make sure, you know, isn't uh, we want to make sure is out there is that uh, nobody is arguing that removing the dams will not improve salmon survival rates. We've spoken with many uh, proponents of the issue, whether that's uh, the person who uh, actually submitted the public comment back in January. Um, we've spoken to the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, who are the ones who manage these dams. Um, and something that we've found across the board is that people do acknowledge that removing dams will improve salmon survival rates, as the studies have shown, as Murray and Inslee's offices um, have reminded us. So then, you know, what, what is the real question here? Uh, the main the main uh, discussion here, the reason that this isn't the black or white issue is because these dams do produce benefits. So a large part of it is the matter of weighing the benefits versus the cost, the cost being salmon survival. So one of the biggest points for the opposition is that um, these dams do currently produce hydroelectricity for our region. Um, however, the report that was released on June 9th did find that all of the energy, 100% and more of the energy uh, produced by the Snake River dams can be replaced uh, within a matter of years by truly clean energy, such as wind, solar, or other things that don't affect salmon, um, and in an affordable manner as well. And because of that, uh, we don't think it's a question of, you know, are we going to lose all this energy by removing the dams? Because the dam removal plan, uh, the ones being considered by Inslee and Murray right now, um, do incorporate, you know, this whole aspect of replacing that energy. So no energy is going to be lost uh, through this process. And again, our letter, you know, the thing that we're talking about today, um, advocates, uh, it explicitly advocates for replacement of dams energy. We do write in the letter that we're demanding not just dam removal, but replacement of clean energy. Uh, we, uh, supporting dam removal, believe that clean energy and salmon survival do not have to be, I should say, mutually exclusive. Um, they should not have to be mutually exclusive. And finally, another uh, valid concern is cost for dam removal, because of course, it's not just removing the dams, replacing all the benefits will take a significant amount of money. This is going to be uh, one of the biggest salmon conservation efforts, if not the biggest one across the United States in history. So it, it is a very big deal, and there are going to be a lot of costs. Um, the report uh, commissioned by Governor Inslee and Senator Murray, released on June 9th, found that the total replacement cost of all the benefits, so not just dam removal, but not just renewable energy, all the benefits, irrigation, transportation, everything, um, would cost up to 10 point to between $10.3 billion to $27.2 billion. This sounds like a lot of money, and it is a lot of money, but in order to put that in perspective, uh, the U.S. government has spent between 16 and $18 billion um, on failed salmon recovery efforts in order to accommodate for these dams just in the past uh, two or three decades. So as you can see, the United States government is already spending billions and billions of taxpayer money on efforts that are unlikely to work based on the science. And here we have a... Um, a proposal by Governor Murray, Senator, I mean, Governor Inslee, Senator Murray, and many other experts saying that uh, we know that we can remove these dams and save these salmon uh, for around the same cost. So this is a long-term solution and could save taxpayers money in the long term, especially because um, another thing to keep in mind is that these dams were built in the 1970s. There's much more efficient technology right now, um, meaning that if we replace the dams with new clean energy sources, um, they, they could cost taxpayers less in the long run and save money in that way as well. Why does the Sammamish Youth Board care? You know, it sounds like these dams are on the other side of the state, and then here we are, you know, a group of mostly like middle school and high school students who are trying to take these dams down. Why is that? Um, the first thing is, of course, this issue affects the entire Pacific Northwest, whether that's through affecting indigenous communities, whether that's affecting our own communities, um, affecting the economy, because, of course, healthy salmon is necessary for a healthy seafood industry, and, of course, all the ecosystems that rely on the salmon ranging from the orca all the way to inland Idaho. Um, the second thing is that as youth representatives of Sammamish, we believe we have a responsibility to stand in solidarity with other communities in Washington and the Northwest who need our support. 
In this case, this happens to be um, many different communities, including notably Northwest Indigenous tribes, who have already voiced their support um, for, for dam removal in many cases, as seen with the, um, the AT&I resolution passed, I believe, last year, which was about a group of uh, Indigenous tribes across the Northwest uh, coming together and publishing a letter saying that we need to remove these dams. So we want to make sure that we're elevating their voices in discussions where they're not usually given the same considerations. Environmental ecological topics in general, whether that's climate change, whether that's clean water, all of these topics affect our, the younger generations, including myself and my generation, because of course, we're gonna be the ones to grow up and deal with the consequences um, of the actions that are taken around these issues. Next, youth perspectives have thus far been largely absent from this entire question of should the dam be removed and uh, the entire discussion surrounding salmon as a whole. So we wanna make sure that as the people who are gonna be inheriting all of this, we wanna make sure that um, we are having a voice and a seat at the table. And finally, you know, why, why a letter? Why is a letter what we chose to do? Writing a letter and signing off on it as a board and sending that in during the public comment period is probably the most feasible method in our current time frame to get youth voices to the state level regarding this issue. Because of course, uh, while this is a national issue, it, the dams are um, going to either stay up or be taken down based on congressional decisions. It's going to be heavily influenced by our state representatives, um, Senator Murray, and even Governor Inslee, who won't directly be voting on it. And we want to reach them while public comment period is open. We think this is a valuable opportunity that we don't want to pass up. And then, of course, a lot of you are probably familiar with the letter. Uh, I'm sure all of you have read it at this point, as well as the letter is very similar to the uh, initial letter we had back in January. Um, again, we're just showing support for dam removal, demanding guarantee of 100% clean energy replacement. We want to emphasize solidarity with Indigenous communities, and we want to demonstrate that this is an issue important to not just, uh, not just communities in southeastern Washington, but youth across the region. And then finally, you know, just starting to wrap things up, um, why approve this? Of course, the mission of the Sonoma Youth Board is to unite youth, adults, and government. The former relationship that promotes equality and mutual respect, that was taken from the uh, City of Sammamish website. Um, and again, we want to point out that this was unanimously approved by the Sammamish Youth Board in November. So what we're really asking for here is uh, the agency to represent our own voice as the youth of Sammamish um, on issues that we feel are important. Second of all, uh, we do, again, demand 100% replacement of clean energy. So energy replacement should not be a concern in this, uh, in this discussion. And finally, we're getting involved because the issue impacts the entire Northwest, not just the region where the dams are, um, economically, ecologically, and culturally. So yeah, as I mentioned, we're asking for approval to represent our own unanimous views on the issue. We are not asking the city council to sign on to this letter. We're asking for permission for us as the Spanish Youth Board to have an independent voice um, from the city. And then finally, an update to the letter. Um, of course, this is something that we have gone over with uh, many council members already um, to finalize you know, the wording on this. Um, and what we came up with is at the bottom of our letter, we do include the disclaimer that the Spanish City Council has not uh, you know, taken a clear stance on this issue and thereby does not explicitly, explicitly endorse the position taken by the Spanish Youth Board, just to make that distinction that you know, the, this is the Spanish Youth Board speaking, we're not dragging the rest of the city in with us. And yeah, I believe that's everything I had. Were there any questions? All right, thank you. Councilmember Stewart. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Monit, um, were there any um, of the indigenous tribes that are opposed to this position or are they all in favor of removing these dams? I'm sure that they are. there are some uh, in opposition to the dams. Of course, uh, me personally, I'm not uh, com like an expert on the indigenous uh, tribes' perspectives on this issue, but the ones that I have talked to, um, such as the Nespers and the Umatilla, have come out in support of this, as well as the, um, the ATNI. I forget what it stands for. I think it's the Affiliated Tribes of Northwest Indians, um, which is a group of a lot of tribes from across the Northwest, came together and issued a joint resolution saying that we should take down the dam. So I would say a large majority are uh, definitely in uh, opposition to the dam. Okay, um, I would just like to throw out that um, I think uh, for the Sammamish Youth Board or any of our commissions that um, if they're gonna take a position as the board, then it should be with our um, explicit, you know, blessing to do so. I'm not in favor of having our boards um, represented as the a Sammamish board take actions or take positions if the, if the council doesn't endorse it. Um, I think just like we have a rule in our council rules that say, you know, I can go out and endorse something as myself, a member of the Sammamish City Council, but I cannot say, you know, the Sammamish City Council does X unless we have the 
the agreement of the council. So um, with that, I'd like to make a motion that we as the Sammamish City Council uh, support the Sammamish Youth Board in signing on to this letter uh, and that we remove the uh, disclaimer from the letter saying that the Sammamish City Council does not endorse a position. Um, and so yeah, so I make that motion. Uh, oh, I second that. Um, and then if I may speak to my motion, um, uh, like I already said, I, I think it's important that our boards, we all speak with one voice. Um, I think that uh, if we're going to do a land acknowledgement and say that we acknowledge the caretakers of this land, um, we have to back that up with actions. Uh, your letter does not, you know, say to, to do this, you know, without uh, an action plan to account for all of the benefits that the dams provide. And so I think that mitigates, um, you know, much of the, the opposition to the removal of the dams. Um, you s explicitly state that it has to replace the clean energy, the transportation benefits. Um, and uh, I think there was a third one uh, that I'm not recalling at the moment, but um, I appreciate that your letter calls for that action plan. Um, and again, I think if we're gonna have a land acknowledgement and we're gonna say we're allies, then we have to actually act as allies. Thank you. And thanks uh, to Monit, to you and the youth board for all the work here. All right, so we do have a motion on the floor. Would you like to speak to it? Oh yeah, Monit, can you stop sharing so we can see everybody? Yes, I, I will you. speak to this motion. I'm not in favor of supporting this. Um, I, un I, I appreciate uh, Council Member Stewart's position on this, that it, we should be a unified voice. I don't know that we are 100% on this. And uh, I'm very uncomfortable with promoting that as a, as a Sammamish uh, initiative. However, having said that, in terms of providing agency to our groups, you know, I, I think that that's something that we should have figured out before this whole process started but I do not support this motion. David Mary Lamb. I wanna thank Monet for coming back and reworking his presentation. I think it's much clearer now to me than it was um, prior um, when it was presented the first time. I am totally comfortable with signing on to the letter. Thank you. Councilmember Stewart, did you? All right, is there any further discussion? All right, so the motion has been moved and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. So by a vote of three, two, um, that passes. So thank you so much, Mona and Chris. Thank you. Okay, so next um, we have unfinished business, TCIP. So I believe um, Doug and Audrey are coming on. Hello. Good evening, everyone. Um, I believe Audrey's gonna provide a quick intro, so I will wait for her to come on. Good evening, Mayor, Deputy Mayor and Council. Um, Audrey Starcy, Acting Public Works Director. This evening, we are presenting you with the 2023 through 2028 Transportation Capital Improvement Plan, or TSIP. Um, Doug McIntyre, our Senior Transportation Planning Manager, will be presenting this evening along with Victor Saleman and I will all be available for discussion. And um, looks like Doug is ready, so please take it away. Okay, thank you, Audrey. Can everyone see the screen? Okay, yes. great. Good evening, uh, Mayor Clark order. and members of the council. My name is point, Doug McIntyre. Point of order. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, Doug, for interrupting, but on the agenda, we had a public hearing, and I think we have to, and I, I appeal to the attorney here, if we have to close this before this presentation, or do we have to hear the public hearing uh, comments that people have? Are there people who've signed up to speak? The presentation can go ahead of the public hearing. 
that's fine. Um, and I don't know if that was the plan, but that's certainly fine okay. in terms of sequencing. Thank you for the clarification. Sorry about that, Doug. No problem at all. Thank you. Cool. Good to clarify. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay. Um, so tonight we're here to uh, talk to you about the 2023-2028 Transportation Capital Improvement Plan um, and ask council to uh, adopt the TIF. Um, so just the things we'll cover today, it's a really quick presentation, uh, but we're going to just cover the purpose and do a little recap of where we've been. Um, and then we'll review the changes that we've uh, made since the last meeting, which was on June 7th, which was, uh, as Councilman Vitrine pointed out, the opening of the public hearing. Uh, we will uh, ask Council to close the public hearing, and then we'll ask Council to uh, adopt the plan. Um, again, just uh, kind of reiterating uh, the purpose for tonight, but um, uh, ending with the adoption of the 2023-2028 the TIF. Um, so just to recap where we've been, uh, this is our sixth presentation on the TIF this year. Uh, we started on April 12th uh, with kind of an outline of the, the plan and getting council buy-in. We went uh, on the 26th of April with our first workshop, and that was kind of a, a deep dive into what, uh, what we wanted to include in the TIF and uh, kind of laying out the next steps. Uh, May 10th, we actually talked about prioritization and ranking projects. On May 24th, we held a second workshop where we uh, did a further deep dive uh, on projects and revenues uh, again. Um, and then June 7th there, we had the public hearing and uh, took public testimony among uh, further discussions. Um, through this process, we've currently, uh, as, of, as of July 1st, actually received 19 public comments. Those are both written and verbal. Um, those are included in Exhibit 3 of the Agenda Bill. We have received um, additional public comments, uh, both email and, uh, as you heard earlier tonight, some commentary in the public comment uh, verbally. So um, it, it now exceeds 19, but uh, we have 19 included in the Exhibit 3 of the Agenda Bill. And um, uh, those were uh, categorized and, and sort of ordered by, um, by time that they were submitted. So with that being said, um, just a few things to cover uh, for Council's benefit uh, prior to discussions. Uh, we wanted to cover some changes. So uh, we'll break it into two categories, just changes for projects and then changes for revenues. So um, uh, one of the first changes to talk about here tonight is the commentary we received at our last meeting about sidewalk, the sidewalk program, PRC. Um, there was a desire to add more money to it um, and make it a more robust program. Uh, at, at that time, we had relatively uh, small amount of money allocated to it over the six-year window, and we have beefed it up quite a bit, um, roughly uh, $3 million per year for that program. I do want to make a point that this is, um, uh, given, given that input, we wanted to incorporate it, but uh, it is actually uh, unsecured revenue that we're showing in, in the TIF now of about $17.4 million. So uh, we will, uh, as it's presented in the council packet tonight, it is showing this change as you see it. Um, however, if council has any direction uh, or any changes to make, uh, we would seek uh, a vote on that to make sure that we're uh, incorporating everything um, as council uh, wishes us to. Um, so the second change to uh, projects uh, is for the transit study. We actually increased that dollar amount from 50,000 to 200,000 to reflect uh, kind of a more in-depth study and a more in-depth level of uh, effort. Um, and just to make sure that we're doing everything appropriately and covering everything that we think that we need to. Some additional project changes, um, TR-115. Uh, this one uh, was also responding to comment we received on the 7th, uh, which is <clears throat> uh, essentially moving dollars to the out years further out in the six-year window. So currently it is now $400,000 being shown uh, in 2023 instead of $1.3 million. Um, and then the final item on the slide here, TR-18, which is the corridor improvement project uh, kind of spanning Southeast 8th from 212th all the way uh, up through the 216, 217, 218 corridor that kind of weaves through uh, north-south. Um, we are moving money to, to out years on this to reflect that we did not receive the federal STP grant funding um, that we applied for back in, in the spring. Um, those recommendations just came out and we were uh, not in the top 10 uh, list. So we wanted to just reflect that. Um, and then uh, there was an email earlier uh, today about um, something that we actually did miss in this list uh, for calling out. So uh, TR45, which is the intersection at uh, 244th and Southeast 32nd, um, that 
that money had previously been shown uh, as $150,000, and uh, we are re we reduced it to $8,000 to reflect the council direction received on June 14th um, during option one for that intersection. So sorry for that uh, oversight in our meeting there. But also thank you for bringing it up because I do think it's important to uh, address. Um, so those are the project uh, changes now uh, onto the revenue changes. So the general fund any balance revenue uh, actually dropped a little bit uh, from 16.5 million to 13 million. And that reflects just some of the moving of, of money uh, that we did and some of the, um, the rejiggering of everything that, that went on. Um, and then finally, again, just reemphasizing that there's now $17.4 million being shown in new unsecured revenue uh, to account for more funds being uh, allocated to the TRC sidewalk projects. <clears throat> So just a summary, because I think this is useful. Um, this slide actually hasn't changed except for the row. Um, there hasn't changed too much uh, with regard to the row uh, second to bottom. Uh, again, just emphasizing the unsecured revenue for the sidewalk projects at 17.4 million. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then just showing how everything else is shifted around. Uh, that brings us to a total of 80 million for the six year tip. Uh, this is the reasonably uh, uh, anticipated revenue sources. So uh, with that, I will just basically close the presentation. Um, council will need to take action to close the public hearing after taking any additional public comment um, and then approving resolution, which is exhibit one uh, in the packet for tonight. Uh, once that is done, we will then transmit the tip to WashDOT uh, for their record keeping. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Doug. So I'll open it up if we have any comments in here. All right, we do have one. Hey, Doug, will you stop sharing your screen? Thanks. I just have one question. Yeah. So the, the question I have for Doug is that um, when we were rejected for the STP grant, did they give you, do you just hear rejected or do you get explanation or rationale? It's relatively new news. Um, so we have not had a chance to reach back out to PSRC or, or King County really um, about the competitive process. I know that we did follow the process and it was very competitive. There were, I believe around 40 project applications submitted and they only funded 10. So um, th what we did glean from the information was that they were going for projects that were basically ready to construct. Um, and they were projects that were pretty urban in nature. So the bigger cities tended to get the awards, Bellevue, you know, Seattle, that kind of thing. Um, but but it, it just gleaning information, again, not not having had a chance to talk to King County, but they were looking to fund construction, basically. Is there any consideration to projects that are already kind of started or have, or have, are underway in some way? As, as far as the projects that did get funded through that process? Yeah. There were a few that had some right-of-way acquisition um, funded in, in the competitive process. I believe I saw one that was for design, but it, it was design and right-of-way acquisition. So um, those projects are a little further down the line, uh, but by and far, they were funding construction projects. So that was, um, that was I think, the, the real knock against us. Okay, thank you. Welcome. All right, so we'll take our first comment um, inside here. Thank you, this is Debbie Treen, lived in Sammamish for about 12 years now. And I appreciate the opportunity to speak. It was, there was confusion about the, te the uh, hearing being closed or not, so I apologize. I did prepare some remarks though um, about a few specific projects. First of all, the one that was just adjusted by the staff at your request, TRC, for sidewalk funding, uh, increasing to I think $18 million for sidewalks, I, I'm absolutely supportive of improving the sidewalk situation in Sammamish, but I really think that's a lot of money to not have any specific projects identified, and it would make sense to do at least a little bit of work about where you want that those funds to be spent, and I would urge you to do that within walking distance of schools and use it to just really improve the situation around the schools. Um, TRF has to do with light pollution, or sorry, has to do with adding street lights in areas where roads are unsafe. And I um, just wanted to highlight my concern for light pollution in general, um, affects bird migration and other wildlife behavior. And so we should carefully evaluate whether reflective paint and other solutions can be used to improve safety in segments that 
maybe are a little too dark. I happen to live in one, and I value the darkness of it, frankly. Um, I'm supportive of TRG to increase the number of school zones to make to improve safety around schools. The one I am, a couple that I'm concerned about, one is TR1, the $200,000 designated for another transit study. Uh, we've, I'd be curious from staff, how many dollars have we already spent in studying transit in this city over the last 10 years? Um, and how many tax dollars have been contributed by some Amish residents to make that happen? Uh, and how many tax dollars are we giving to ST3 to support transit through our tax dollars? Um, it just seems to me that what we really need is a comprehensive plan for transportation that includes all the modes, transit, roads, pedestrians, non-motorized, and to focus on continually on one segment is just not going to be effective. So I would hope that you would consider applying that $200,000 to a more robust study of the entire transportation system in Sammamish, uh, built upon ultimate build out of the city. So we really have a long-term plan for, for the, the uh, transportation, for roads, transit, pedestrian, et cetera. And then our citizens can kind of start to rely on what to expect, because right now it seems like no money gets spent on roads and it's really hard to feel like there's a plan and it would be wonderful to see a nice long range plan developed. Um, the last thing I wanna point out, just in looking at this, this TIP, it's really obvious how big a mistake it is to re remove a segment V over C as a concurrency requirement. This city has tons of roads that have no intersections that are going to be evaluated. And if we don't deal with the segments, we're leaving a very large gap in our concurrency. Thank, Thank you. you so much. All right, so we'll move to online comments. If you wish to provide public comment, please raise your hand. For attendees who are joining by phone, please raise your hand by pressing star nine. Okay. We have one commenter so far. I will promote to comment. And we're going to set the clock up here so the commenter can see it on the screen. Hi, this is Mary Wichter. I've lived in Sammamish 20 years. I just have a brief comment. Um, with regard to pavement projects in the past, Mark Cross had looked at budgets and said, hey, they always had $3 million budgeted, but only $2 million in staff to be able to be the inside people in order to get contracts working to do those. And I remember, I think it was about when Pam Stewart first became a council member, there had been $3 million for sidewalks and they couldn't decide what to spend it on. So they just removed it from the budget. So there's been sidewalk gap projects for a while. So I do understand um, and agree with a bunch of things that Debbie Train had said, particularly with regard to sidewalks. But the problem is you also have areas that have sidewalk gaps that just aren't getting addressed. So you do have places where you could assign that money to, and I don't know if um, the, 18 million or 7.4 million is the right amount or how to get those funds. But I do know, for example, uh, this council recently had voted to uh, extend uh, pedestrian access on 218th, which is sort of by Big Rock Park um, going uh, west from the town center. And um, I know Lewis Thompson Road is gonna get sidewalks. Um, and then there's a gap between there and then 218th. So there are gaps where sidewalks do cost quite a bit to do. Um, and they need to get done. And the other thing I would always encourage you to work with is Sammamish Plateau Water. I attend a bunch of their meetings. They have about three Mondays of every month. And they are looking at um, immediate interim and then long-term fixes. And one of their long-term fixes for the sewer is to put some sewer pipes up to 18th, which would kind of go up some of the same way that you're doing. So it's really important that you're communicating with them so they know what's going on because if they're ripping up the roads and you're ripping up the roads or you're adding sidewalks, if it's done all at one time, I think you have mobilization and cost savings to do that. So those are just some words of caution. Otherwise, I um, think that you guys have done a great job taking input and thanks to everybody who was involved. All right, thank you. All right, is there anyone else? I do not see any more commenters. Thank you. Great. So before I pass it to council, should I close? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. 
All right, so um, this public hearing for the 2023-2028 Transportation Capital Improvement Plan adoption hearing is now closed. Um, so council, I will open it up for you um, for a motion or perhaps some questions. Council Member Treen. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I've reviewed the TCIP. I'm largely in support of the plan. I am concerned though about two items that need to be further discussed on funding. These two items need to be revisited in detail during our budget discussions. Uh, it is not that I am against them moving forward. I just want to address the impact of the two items to the operating budget and the capital budget. The two items are TR53 and TR1. TR53 is uh, about 1.5 million for the Sahali Way Northeast 28th Place, 233rd uh, Avenue Northeast intersection, and TR1 is the Transit Study Program. Um, and then my uh, the other thing that, with the savings po or possible savings that we could. Uh, have at the budget time, I would encourage the, the adding of 1.5 million to TR19 as seed money for that project. So finally, I move to adopt the 2023-2028 TCIP Transportation Capital Improvement Plan as presented by the staff with three modifications. First, that TR-53, that intersection improvement at Sahali Way, Northeast 28th Place, 233rd Avenue Northeast, be revisited in detail as part of the budget discussion. Second, that the TR-1 Transit Study Program be revisited in detail as part of the budget discussion in September. Third, that the TR-19 Wash Dot SR-202 Sahali Way intersection have 1.5 million assigned as seed money to move the roundabout project down there forward as Sammamish taking the lead. I'll second that. All right, so we move and second it. Would you like to speak to that? Yeah, I, I, it's, a, it's, we, it's, a one, it's really a TCIP for one year. We get to revisit this again in a year. Last year, uh, a little historical information, last year we had a TCIP and we were still finishing up the EIS. The projects that are on this TI TCIP are the same that were there last year that, that I was in support of. Uh, with the exception, with the additions of the results of the EIS and with the addition of the change in that um, resolution that we did to um, move forward with option one. Um, and then I think that at some point here, I would like to have the, I mean, so we got to get this one year thing. So I don't want to speak too much to this next point, but just to say that I, I, I often feel like in two and a half years, we've worked backwards. And so we don't have a transportation master plan. And so I would like us to see if we could flip that script here at some point so that we're actually working our TCIP is a part, is being fed by our transportation master plan. And so I think this year, this is a good next step to get us through the, the choke points uh, and taking care of some of the projects that, need to, that are priority to this council. And, and then we're also uh, we're satisfying the law too at the same time. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Councilmember Howard, do you want to speak to this? To speak to that motion, uh, I, the reason why I supported it is I think uh, I think Councilmember Treen made a lot of sense there, and I would ha have a, uh, a point of question or clarification maybe around the 200000 for the transit study. I think um, the way that Metro looks at themselves is they don't look at themselves as a bus company. They look at themselves as a transportation entity. And that includes all facets. And so Metro has expanded their definition of what they are and who they what they do to include multimodal as part of their own um, in, it, it, their own rebranding. 
And so I, I wonder if there isn't automatically, just by definition, if we say transit, if there isn't an automatic expansion of the terminology there to include broader concepts around, tra around transportation in general. Great, thank you. Councilmember Stewart? Yeah, um, I know there's a motion on the floor and I have some questions uh, that I'd like to ask to make a determination if I can support the motion as, as it stands, if that's okay. Um, one big question um, that I didn't see answered in the packet was um, there was discussion that we have um, transportation impact fees that are going to expire. Um, and as the TCIP is today, there is no plan to spend any TIF dollars in 2023. And so I want to know, are there TIF funds that are going to expire in 2023? So um, I can take a stab at that. <clears throat> so yes, there are some TIF dollars that are going to be expiring in 2023. I don't recall the exact amount. Um, it's it's a smaller portion. Um, it, I don't believe it's it's in the millions. I believe it's in the thousands. Um, <clears throat> the having the project TR 115 Sahali Way uh, on the list uh, will allow us to spend traffic impact fee dollars. Um, so that is one thing that uh, that we can use it on. Um, and the other project was, was Esquapanic Road that is eligible for TIF funds, and that project, uh, based on previous conversations, was moved uh, to a lo the longer range category um, and for in favor of the Sahali project. So uh, all the TIF dollars uh, that we can use would be used on Sahali. So, but you're only planning to spend $400,000 next year on Sahali. So I can't support any TCIP until I know that we have a plan that actually makes sure we spend all of the potential TIF funds that are going to expire. I don't want to give any TIF dollars back. Right, that is the plan. That That is the plan to use, that, use the expiring TIF dollars on solid. But you don't know exactly how many TIF dollars are expiring next year, and the plan right now says we're only spending $400,000 on Sahali. So do we know, are the expiring TIF funds 400000 or less? Let me see if I can bring that up real quick. Audrey, do you recall the amount of money? No, I know we have the, the data available. I just don't have it off the top of my head. Okay, because yeah. I just want to make sure. we discussed it previously as well. Yeah, and and is the 400000 for Sahali next year, I'm assuming that's to develop a plan for Sahali? Right, and it would pay for design, design study, that, that kind of work, yes. Okay, so I mean, I'd be supportive as long as we're sure that whatever we're planning to do next year uses all of the available or all of the expiring TIF funds. Um, I think that's critical. Um, the other that thing, the oh, sorry, go ahead, Doug. Oh, I was just gonna say that is the intent, yes. Yeah, um, TR 109, um, are we really planning to be able to complete that next all next year? Is that? Oh wait, that is that. Yeah, hold on. Let me get to the right page. The reconstruction of uh, East Lake Sammamish uh, shoreline. Yeah, is that is that reasonable that that's going to all happen next year? I believe it is. Um, okay. Audrey might have more specific information on that. Um, I believe it is as well. So it is currently um, we are undergoing geotech and survey and design and all awesome. of that preliminary work. So, cool. Um, unless we find any unexpected surprises, I. I, we're hopeful for construction next year. Great. Um, I too share the concern about the TRB through G. Um, I feel like we have allocated funds there, which are great. Um, I support um, those projects, but it feels like we've just peanut buttered some money in there and we don't really have a plan. Um, I know, again, back in in 2018, when I joined the council, the staff was, I think, 60 or 70 percent of the way done with a transportation master plan, and unfortunately, it was uh, voted um, by a, a split council to stop work on that. Um, so I, I don't know if the TCIP is the right place to to show it, but I do, I do concur that we we really have to have a master plan before we can move forward, and and the. 
allocation of $18 million towards sidewalks, which again, I wholeheartedly support that we need. Um, I'd like to see them as part of a plan. Uh, particularly, I'd like to see us have a safe routes to school plan um, as a sub plan to our transportation master plan, quite honestly. I think that is a, a number one concern. Um, I don't know that that has to be reflected here exactly in the TCIP, um, but I do think that that is something we need to reconcile um, when we get into the budget and then plan to update the TCIP based on what we do in, in terms of the budget there so that we have a budget, a work plan, and a TCIP that all actually work in, in concert together. Um, I'm curious why we have a TRH on there that is a, a contingency, but there's no dollars to it. I'm not sure why that's still on, if that matters, but it seems odd. Um, I can, uh, so yes, we can, <clears throat> that TRH is, uh, I believe from our previous comprehensive planning efforts. That's why we wanted to make sure there's consistency between the two. Uh, we don't currently have a need for that, so that's kind of why uh, we didn't have that, but we wanted to make sure we showed it for consistency between the comp plan and this version of the TIP. Um, and then just to answer your question earlier about the traffic impact fee dollars, I did look at the report that is um, sent to council by finance. So I was able to bring it up. Uh, and it says in 2023, the fees that were collected in 2013 that are going to be expiring, uh, that you're reaching that 10 year spending requirement limit. Uh, $309,319. So um, we will be able to, uh, to accomplish that. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you for that. Um, for TR106, which is the overlay project, I thought that the ask was to increase that quite substantially to like three and a half million a year, I thought it was, from one million a year, but that's not reflected here. Um, <clears throat> So we can uh, we can do that. Uh, I think one we need council direction on that. Uh, I think that would be important. Um, and then also we would need to understand where that money, where that revenue would be coming from. Uh, we could use kind of a similar approach what we did with the sidewalk projects, which is for programmatic efforts, <clears throat> similar to similar to a pavement uh, uh, overlay uh, preservation pro uh, program we would um, want to at least identify a, a revenue source, but it, having an in, unsecured source of funding shown on the tip, I think it's okay, um, but we would want council to be okay with that. Yeah. Because at just this point I, in time, everything balances. Um, so yeah, go ahead, Audrey, sorry. I was just gonna add on as well. Um, so I, my understanding of TR 106 was the overlay projects are, that intent for that project was for those streets that are beyond repair through our, our typical operating, right? So um, Jim presented a few weeks ago to council about our, our, um, our, our funding that would be selected for, or through the budget process. Um, so different opportunities, crack sealing, um, slurry seals and different things that would be pavement management and restoration efforts as a separate funding mechanism through the operating budget. This is TR 106, which is be those streets that are beyond that repair. Okay. And, and the, again, the, the, the million dollars a year that you have there, if that's actually to repair streets that are kind of beyond the, the overlay um, capabilities, is that, is that just a placeholder or do you have streets that you believe you, you know and that a million dollars is a reasonable estimate? I would need to confirm um, with our city engineer on that, but I, my understanding is that there are a handful of streets that are beyond that. Uh, preservation mode. Okay. Um, I think um, I'm, I'm generally okay. Uh, I do want to make sure again that as, as we move forward, if we can, that we can get the, the TCIP, the budget, and the work plan to be documents that all align because right now it feels like they don't. And, and that may just be um, because I know they, they kind of get updated at different times, but I think it's really important because this document, you know, the, the items on here that we fund and that we show completing in six years, those will be things that do get added to our traffic model. And so it's really important that they are realistic, that we do really have a, um, 
a, a, not just an intent, but a plan to be able to get them completed, at least, especially for the ones that are in the next, you know, two to three years, because I think if we don't have a plan for those, they're definitely not going to happen. Um, I do have more questions, but I don't know that, um, I don't know that we have to answer those tonight to be able to support, um, you know, passing this. I do think it's critical. We've been non-compliant for the last two years, and I definitely want us to become compliant again. Um, I'm just looking through all of my uh, questions here. Um, oh, my last question is for the Issaquah School District, where we show the, what is it, the 3.7 million that we're getting from them. Is that work, work that we are going to do and manage, and Issaquah is just giving us 3.7, or that's projects that they're going to do and we're just showing them on there because we know that they're going to happen within our right of way. It's the second. Okay. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the latter, yeah. So the amount of money that's shown there, um, we should be making sure Issaquah has the appropriate amount of money, but that's not really... Um, okay, perfect. Um, I would like to uh, um, make an amendment to, to the motion on the floor, and that is that I don't feel the need to revisit a trans transit study. Um, I think we absolutely need, need a transit study. Um, so that we can get to the bottom of what uh, what we need to do to make transit, um, you know, people ride transit, what we need to do to do that. So I would like to propose an amendment that we remove the, we strike the line item um, about the transit study in the current motion. I second that. All right, and again, just to speak to that motion, I think we've already asked for a transit study to happen. I think we know we have to figure out ways to make transit uh, work in Sammamish and particularly in moving people to the light rail. So um, I'm fully supportive of whatever funding we have to spend to get that information. Um, long term, we can't continue by just building wider roads and adding cars. Uh, we need to provide people with viable alternatives. So thank you. All right, so the amendment has been moved and seconded. Um, Deputy Mayor Lamb, did you have? I was just gonna ask Doug if he had an update on transit. I know he's mentioned that a couple of times that they were talking to transit. Um, I don't at the moment, but uh, there are some additional things that we've learned recently, which is uh, one that the city of Pisplaw has started a transit uh, study as well. And so I think there are some timeliness uh, elements to that. We wanna make sure we can share resources I have a meeting scheduled with my counterpart in Issaquah for, I believe, two weeks from now to discuss um, exactly what they're doing, the scope of their work, and that kind of thing so that we can better inform our planning. So there are some uh, benefits to be gained from that. Um, so I think that's kind of the, the best update I have at this moment. And that um, increase from 50,000 to 200,000, where does that come from? Is it from, uh, like, where does that number come from? Yeah, that's a good question. It's partially from the REIT dollars. Um, <clears throat> I believe we are now showing uh, 50,000. Um, give me one second while I navigate to it. Uh, Councilmember Lamb, were you asking? I was, I was asking well that, but is yeah. it tied to a plan? <laughs> Saying what, what's the reason for the need to increase the amount, Doug, I think was the question from Deputy Oh, the Mayor reason Lamb. for the, yeah. the need. Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, we wanna make sure that we do the most comprehensive study that we can. Um, I think that uh, 50,000 was probably not gonna get us everything that we wanted to do. Uh, we need to understand, uh, Council Member Howell, I believe mentioned that um, correctly, that Metro has really expanded the, the scope of what they do. They call themselves a mobility agency now, and that is a kind of an indication of how they view themselves. In fact, we, we work with them on alternative transit. So they're not just looking at buses, they're looking at all kinds of other ways to move people through the system. So we wanna make sure that we capture all of that, make sure that we're doing um, uh, really the most comprehensive effort that we can. Uh, that also includes working with re regional partners like Issaquah and others that where there are a lot of overlaps, um, as well as of course working with Metro, which they've indicated that they would love to be part of um, a study and helping us um, kind of navigate through that. Um, I just wanted to, thank you for that. I just wanted to um, mention that I know we talked about not having specific plans for the sidewalk, not, spe not specific projects. I guess that kind of echoes what um, Council Member Stewart was saying is that I don't know what projects are tied to specific 
um, line items like the street lighting program. I'm not sure what what projects are actually tied to that and school zone safety improvement. So it'd be really helpful to know exactly what those um, projects are tied to. But overall, I think the the TCIP plan, I'm okay with it. I did want to mention um, where Council Member Treen was saying putting seed money into TR 19. Um, I just disagree with that. And I think it's more important to address TR 103, just knowing that the um, light rail station is going into Mary in Marymore. And I've been bringing that up multiple times. And I also realized that we've added um, that, that item onto the Bluma. Thank you. If I, if I can respond to one part of that, because I think um, uh, the question has come up a couple times now uh, regarding the sidewalk priority projects. So um, in, in researching this, Jeff and Audrey and I have found a previous document from, I believe, 2018 that did prioritize some sidewalk projects. And, and I believe Jeff did share that with the council uh, maybe a month ago or so. Um, and so I think the intent would be that we would look, look at that work and see if we can reuse that as much as possible and, um, and go back to council to say, here's... Here's a list, um, how can we improve it, that kind of thing. So, so it is definitely, this is sort of the first step in that um, is making sure that we uh, have a plan to do that and then we can look at what that list would look like. Um, so, so definitely this is kind of a first step in several steps. All right, so we do have a motion on the floor that has been amended that now we're gonna vote on. Um, Excuse yes. me, Mayor, did, what, did you vote on the amendment yet? No, we haven't voted on anything okay. yet. Right. Yeah. Just, just wanted to yeah. <laughs> so we'll vote on the amendment, yes. Um, so all those in favor to amend uh, keeping in TR1 or I, um, say I. 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 Opposed? Nay. So, I to say I, sorry. I was looking at what TRI was. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, transit study. Yeah. The transit study. So... Four to one, that amendment passes, and now I can vote on the main. Now we can vote on the main motion, which is Councilmember Treen's motion. Um, so all those in favor of Councilmember Treen's motion as amended, say aye. 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 Opposed. Nay. Uh, so four one, that passes as well. So Doug, I think you're free. Go ahead. Thank you. Can I just ask one clarifying question of the motion um, just before I go? Um, the T, the money, the 1.5 million for TR19, um, was that being moved from the? Okay, I see. I see a head shake. So okay, so it's an additional 1.5 million from TR19. But that's only at budget time. Right? At budget time. Not now. It was only. Not now. Time. Okay. Yeah. Not sorry. Now. Revisit so, at budget time. That okay. and um, I think TRI. I guess at some point. No. TR, TR1. TR53, TR oh. Doug, and TR19. And then TR1, I'm not 100% sure, Mayor, on TR1 with the amendment uh, because it was to strike what I put in here, what, I, what my motion was, which was to revisit it in detail as part of the budget discussion. So that part is struck, Doug, from my motion. Uh, and replaced with the le with I don't exactly know what with. It was just to strike it from there because I think we've already given direction to get that started, so I don't think it needs to be revisited. So keeping in TRI no, and not revisiting. It's just it's just that we're approving the TCIP without the need to revisit that specifically. It doesn't mean we can't. It just means that it's not part of the motion. Thank you, Doug, for the did you understand Sorry. That? <clears throat> I do. I do. So it, it, both of these items will get revisited at the budget, but the TSIP as it's presented is passed by resolution. That's, yes. That's what okay. I understand, the council. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, council. All right. Um, next is new business. So um, city manager recruitment kickoff. And I will pass it to Mike. Thank you, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, thank you and good evening, Mayor, Deputy Mayor and Council. While our 
uh, consultant gets set up over here at the podium. I'll just do a brief introduction. Uh, my name is Mike Suggs, Senior Management Analyst for the City Manager's Office, and I am pleased to introduce Greg Prothman, who is the owner of the recruiting firm GMP Consultants. At Council's last regular meeting, you'll recall approving a contract with GMP Consultants to perform the recruitment for the permanent city manager. Mr. Prothman is here tonight to introduce himself, his company, and a little bit about the process. And I just wanted to note that this is um, just the first of several touch points that Council will have with Mr. Prothman's firm um, throughout this recruitment. So it's really just an opportunity to kick off the process and answer any of Council's initial questions. And with that short introduction, I would like to hand it over to Mr. Greg Prothman. Good evening, that's, that's better. <laughs> thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to be here. I really appreciate it. It's good to be back and working with the city again. Um, <clears throat> my pur purpose tonight is to say hi and introduce myself so you now have a face and a voice with the, with the name and to talk a little bit about process and, and what we hope to do in the next uh, couple of weeks. <clears throat> my colleague, uh, Andrew Neiditz, uh, who's currently on vacation as, as timing would have it, He'll be back in about a week and a half, and so he'll be joining me on this search. And if you might recall Andrew's bio, he's the former city manager of the city of Lakewood and uh, the executive director of South Sound 911, uh, a big agency that consolidated all of the 911 agencies into one group in Pierce County. Um, <clears throat> he's currently working with me on the city of um, Newcastle's uh, search right now also. So the very first task we have really is, is to get to know you as individuals and as a council and to get a good sense for what it is you're hoping to see in your next city manager, what skills, talents, traits, qualifications that we hope to find. Um, we'll be working with Mike on getting some of the background detail on the city um, and we've already got a list of stuff heading that direction that we're hoping to start working on. And eventually, the work product out of this effort will be the uh, position profile. We'll put that in front of you. Hopefully, we've hit the, uh, the nail on the head. You won't have too many edits, but hopefully, you'll have some. So we will then find out we're, we're both on the same page when you're done with that. At that point, uh, we're also going to have to talk about compensation, understand sort of what the salary range ought to be for this position, how far and wide you want us to cast the proverbial net which most likely will be national, but really that um, we also want to do a direct mail campaign to city managers in cities of comparable size, 14, 16, 18 Western states. I mean, depending upon how far we want to go. <coughs> Excuse me. So those are all decision points that we'll do up front. Once we're done and we've got the advertising out and we've got the mailer out and we're waiting for applications to come in, I can give you a periodical or a, a, a periodical update on how many applications we're getting. Um, I, I will tell you now that that number will be remarkably smaller than it would have been, say, as little as five years ago. Um, it's almost scary, to be quite honest. We have so many openings out there and so few good city managers um, chasing those openings. Had we done this search five years ago, I might have estimated 30 to 35 applicants. Today, if we get 10 or 12, I'll be, I'll be about where I think we'll land. Having said that, we will get five or six of, of pretty high quality. So you'll have a choice. It just won't be as deep as it once would have been. Um, I've already talked to two or three managers uh, here in the Northwest about this opening uh, down at AWC last week and have got some interest. So. There's hope <laughs> on the horizon line. Really, that's all I had tonight, is just to say hi, talk about the process, talk about first steps, um, talk about um, your involvement and, and when we're gonna be talking to each other. Um, and after we've had a chance to talk with each of you and, and with staff, if that's okay with you folks, is to also talk with your senior staff, and we get a preponderance of applications, we'll be back in front of you in, in work session at that point. We will have interviewed probably the top eight or 10 most qualified or the ones we think are most promising. So we'll bring you back an awful lot of information before we, we trouble you with, with the resumes. And then from there, you'll, you'll direct on who you want us to move forward with. 
uh, this is really your, your search, and I want to make sure that you're, you're firmly in charge of it. Uh, once we get done with the uh, semi-final selection, if we get down to the five, three or four or five finalists, we'll help you design a final interview process. We'll come execute that process with you, and then we'll be there to help uh, negotiate a contract. So I promised about seven or eight minutes tonight, and uh, I think I'm close to that number. Do you, do you have any questions for me? Yeah, Council. Uh, Council Member Howe. Oh, I was startled to hear you say direct mail. So um, <laughs> snail mail too. <laughs> um, and I'm uh, and I understand that there's a professional association that um, the candidates we'd be looking at would no doubt belong to. Absolutely. Um, and so advertisements, of course, would be placed there. But I'm wondering about the um, the uh, network, if yeah. you will. There, so how yeah. how is it that you plunge into these networks of? Because it, I, it's a unique skill set, yes, but it's nonetheless it's one that's. The, mm -hmm. You know, it's a pool. <laughs> How do you dive into that pool and get more information beyond just what you've described? Indeed. Um, and you raise a couple of points. Let me, let me try to knock those off for you. Snail mail versus email. <laughs> what the heck? Are we back in the 1980s? Well, what we find is people get so many emails nowadays, and within one day, they're 140 deep already on that email, and they may miss it, and it just doesn't get rise to the top. The feedback we get about getting an invitation letter, a two-sided invitation letter, is that it comes to their desk, they look at it with their hand, and they sit on the corner of their desk, and they pick it up again later on if they're interested. And that's really the value-added proposition here, is we want to get their attention. We want them to do a little more exploratory thinking about the opportunity. And that tends to be the, the first hook, among others, they'll see in their professional journals and periodicals and professional networks that will reach to them also. The last point you raise is, you know, what is our interpersonal interaction with these folks? How do we get to know them? Well, we're all members of the International City Managers Association. I'm a member of Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and on it goes. Um, I'll be attending the International City Managers Conference here, coming up later in the year. Andrew will be down also uh, doing that. So. Between all of our consultants, and we're all city managers in a former life, the network goes out there exponentially. And so the word's out already. People have already called me saying, hey, I heard you got selected. I said, yeah, we are, and uh, we'll talk more about this as I get to know you folks, and I can begin to tell them more about who you are and what your expectations are. Did that answer your question? It does, thank you. You're welcome. All right, Council, any other questions? Great. Thank right. you so much. Really nice to meet you. My pleasure, too. And thanks again for having me. And yeah. uh, we'll be in touch. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Great. And Mike, I think you even have the next. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, so now we're moving on to the next agenda item here uh, to discuss the selection of a hearing examiner. Um, this uh, agenda item provides council time to discuss the two hearing examiner proposals in your packet this evening and consider selecting a provider to move forward with. Um, as a quick background, the authority for the hearing examiner position is outlined in the city's development code. The code specifies that this position is appointed by the city council to a four-year term and the examiner is responsible for conducting hearings on a variety of land use applications, administrative appeals, and other actions. And two examples of common hearing uh, types that we see uh, frequently are code compliance appeals and preliminary subdivision hearings, among uh, several others. The benefit of having an examiner as opposed to counsel or the planning commission conducting the hearings themselves is that the examiner's decisions are free from any potential political influence and it also allows counsel and the commission to focus on policy making rather than on conducting hearings. In your packet this evening are two proposals that were collected through an RFP process. One proposal is from John Galt who is the city's current hearing examiner and whose contract is due to expire at the end of September. The second proposal is from Sound Law Group and both providers meet our code's minimum qualifications for serving as a hearing examiner. 
With that said, uh, as the hearing examiner is a council appointed position, the recommendation tonight is for council to discuss the proposals and then direct the interim city manager to execute a contract with one of the two providers. And with that, I will go ahead and turn it back over to the mayor. All right, great, thank you. So council, um, I'll open up either for a motion or discussion or questions. Councilmember Howe. Um, I have a question uh, first around how it would function to have a group versus an individual. Because we don't, it, it they would round robin as I understand it, just, you know, it's randomly which one we would get for different hearings out of that group, if I read that correctly. Uh, they proposed a couple that could be interchanged, I thought, or did I misunderstand that? I would have to go back and double check that council member how I'm, I'm sorry I missed that that piece of it but I, I do know there's a they have some depth to their um, list of hearing examiners I can't recall if we'd be assigned one specifically or if that was it would clear be on a rotating basis that we got one I would just look like we like it was more random is what it looked like but I may have misread that sorry Carrie um, to answer Council Member Howe's question, if you look at page 176 of your packet, Sound Law Center does propose that Andrew Reeves be the hearing examiner. They do note that they have other qualified hearing officers available to provide services on a pro tempore basis if needed, and they include another such attorney's uh, resume, Lee Rain, in the proposal, but it is clear from their cover letter again at page 176 of your packet that they're proposing Mr. Andrew Reeves. All right, uh, Councilmember Stewart. Yeah, um, I was curious, uh, hearing examiner Galt put in his letter that um, since they both include fees and such, he also said he would be amenable to extending his current proposal and I didn't know like if one was more advantageous to us than the other? I am not familiar with Mr. Colt's current proposal. Carrie, do you have um, any insight into what that might entail? No, I don't have his current proposal in front of me. Um, he does say on page 173 under cost proposal, he proposes to provide the required services as at its current compensation rate. And then if you go to page 174, um, the rate is listed at $125 per hour, uh, which does not include his travel time. Okay, I didn't know because it just says on, on page, I think it's 175, if the city wishes to simply extend my existing proposal services or personal services agreement, um, he's amenable to that approach. And again, I didn't know if one was more advantageous to us than the other. I think he just means extending the contract, um, but I believe it's at the rate that he puts it's the same in okay. his letter 125 an hour okay well then I would uh, like to make a motion that we um, uh, sign on uh, hearing examiner Galt for another four years I second that all right move and second did you want to discuss? I mean I think he's we've heard from the public um, he seems to be fair he's I don't think we've had any major issues with him and his proposal looks to be slightly more advantageous to us. Um, I do have a question now. Yeah. I'm not sure who can answer it. Um, have, since he's an individual, um, John Galt, have we had any issues where he hasn't been able to attend a meeting, for example, because he is one person versus a firm that has backup? So I'm going to do my best to answer that. I wish David Pyle was here because he's got more information and can go back further in time for a more complete answer. But it's my understanding that hearings are scheduled around Mr. Galt's availability, whether he's got vacation, conflicts with hearings with other jurisdictions, or you know just some other reason why he's unavailable, that he's able to schedule things around his availability. Okay. Oh, here's David, excellent. <laughs> Hello, David. 
Uh, good evening, Mayor. I apologize. <laughs> While I was being promoted to panelists, there was a slight hiccup in the sound, so I didn't hear the most recent uh, point in conversation. Oh, my question was just whether or not, because Mr. Galt is an individual, whether or not there have been any sort of um, schedule conflicts or interest conflicts compared to having a firm to represent. Uh, we, yeah, great question. So we have not had conflicts. Uh, typically our hearings are scheduled quite a ways out um, and Mr. Galt has always found availability. Uh, we have at times had to push it two weeks later or two weeks earlier than what our target date was, which is not a problem. We're able to work around that. Um, but we have not had that issue uh, so far. And all the meetings are remote, right? They are all remote. Uh, and fo following COVID, we have learned how to do remote hearings. Uh, the public has indicated that they really appreciate that if they're at work or if they're out of town, they can participate in the hearing. Um, they don't have to come up to City Hall in the middle of the day. It makes them more accessible. Yes. He's been, we've been using him since 2002. Do you have any concerns about his work? Uh, Mr. Galt does very thorough work. Um, there are times that the department doesn't agree with the decisions, um, but there are times that the uh, applicants or appellants don't agree with the decisions. So on balance, uh, you, you know, um, sometimes you're right, sometimes you're wrong. Um, I think that's just how it works. And uh, we do learn from the decisions that we receive. Uh, I, I believe that applicants and the development community as well as the appellant community learn from the decisions received. Thank you, that, that's super helpful. Councilmember Tree. Yeah, just for clarification, the motion on the floor is to authorize the interim city manager to execute a contract with John Galt, correct? Yes. Yeah, I'm in favor of that. Thank you. All right, motion on the floor, which was greatly repeated. Thank you. Um, we're going to vote on that unless Councilmember Stewart has anything else. Oh, okay. Um, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, 5-0. Um, so John Galt, hearing examiner. Thank you. Uh, all right, next, item number 15, an update on our diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging program, DEIB, with Mark. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. So I'd just like to um, briefly start this off by introducing, for those of you that haven't had a chance to meet, Mark Baird. He is the newest member of our uh, leadership team. He's our administrative services director, which includes our human resources department or uh, office as well as other items. And um, I'd ask Mark to come in and help uh, be in charge of pulling this together and bringing this in front of you and getting direction and feedback so that we can start moving forward with building the rest of the program. So with that, I'd like to introduce Mark and turn it over to him as soon as he uh, <laughs> gets fully promoted and is on screen. There we go. Good, Good evening, uh, Mayor, Deputy Mayor, Council Members. Um, as Scott said, my name is Mark Baird, I'm the Admin Services Director. And I'm gonna share my screen. You know, if they're able to uh, to see that, I would appreciate it. All good. Yeah, we can see it. So this this evening, we're going to give an update on the DEIB program and the proposed resolution. And in a handful of slides, I'll walk through some defining of terms what really is a DEIB program, components of a program, a little bit of background on DEIB in the city, um, offer a proposed starting point, and take a look at some resources that might be needed. It's important when we get started on this topic to really have a good idea about uh, what each of the terms really means. Um, there are many really good definitions out there that consultants and others have, but 
I've offered a few basic ones here for us to take a look at. So quickly, you know, diversity is really the range of human um, differences that we all have. Equity is about having a fair and impartial opportunity within an organization. So for the city, it's about having that fair opportunity for all of our employees across the organization for what they might want to do. Inclusion is really the act of creating an environment where individuals feel welcome. They feel supported and they feel valued. Again, important traits that we want to have for our employees. And belonging is really what you get when you have the other three. Belonging is that idea that you are somewhere that you're comfortable and you um, quite literally belong within the organization because of the others. So in terms of a program, a DEIB program is really an organized intentional process that moves along in agencies, or in this case, um, the city's DEIB strategies in a way that it also tracks their progress. I think that that's an important thing to take a look at. It's not just items in and of itself, but it's also tracking uh, process and the programs. Formal DEIB programs do a number of things to help out organizations and local governments. They improve decision making. They increase community trust in local government. They promote more equitable distribution of public resources. They improve employee satisfaction reduce staff turnover and increase public engagement. And you'll notice the, the top three of those really are outward facing to some extent. And the bottom three really talk a little more about our internal workforce. There are a number of common programmatic elements that most DEIB programs really have. Um, they tend to have legislative statements of support in the form of ordinances or resolutions or executive commitment statements from a mayor. There are staff and community um, groups that get together that help drive the outcome. There's a strong communications component that's related to really advertising the effort that's going on, whether it's a, a real robust web page. Um, communication blurbs that go out, really making people aware both internally and externally of what you're trying to accomplish. Typically, DEIB goals and strategies are included in an organization's strategic plan, or often they have their own roadmap that they follow over the course of a number of years and track against. Uh, there's training that goes out both for people working on the plan and for those conducting the assessment. And then finally, there are adjustments made to a plan as, as they move along, as they see how things are going. The city has some elements of a DEIB program already, but not really a formal program. It has elements like recent procurement policy amendments that focused on non-discrimination policy. It mandates that it follows bidding procedures around women and minority business enterprises. We have equal opportunity employment statements in our employee handbook. We have policies and guidance related to anti-harassment and discrimination. We have some upcoming implicit bias training that's going to be coming online. And we recognize many diverse community events and dates. But these are not really put together in an organized fashion. They are just things over time that the city has done. A program really takes a look at how those are actually doing with some measures to make sure that it hits the appropriate goals. So what would be the first step for the city of Sammamish? Well, the first step would be to approve the DEIB resolution that will be coming back on July 19th. This would establish DEIB principles as truly important to the city. It would direct the interim city manager to keep DEIB as a top priority in budget development and in the operations of the city. 
it would create as a top priority when evaluating policies, programs, and initiatives, and direct the interim city manager to put together a timeline for implementation and to, for creating a robust program within the city. And while that process would be put together by you know, a number of enthusiastic and very knowledgeable people, a sample of what a, what a program could look like is outlined here. It could be in a couple of phases where initially there's the passage of a DEIB resolution. There's the creation of the program under administrative services. Uh, a staff advisory group could be formed and a continued inventory of the other elements that might exist already within the city could take place. In a, in a next phase, there could be additional implicit bias training and other training for employees. There would be the addition of assets like a coordinator and or some consultant services to bring on some experts who really focus on creating successful DEIB programs in local jurisdictions. Data would be collected so that we would have an understanding of really where we are and where our employees think we are as a city on these topics. And then there'd be the creation of a roadmap or a strategic plan to see how we would move towards where the advisory group and the consultants think that we need to go to in order to obtain the goals that we have under such a program. Ongoing, you know, a program is likely to have um, meaningful metrics that are monitored where there's continued training both as new people come into the city and as we move through time and build on existing training that we've already had and then the roadmap would need to be adjusted depending upon what we see we're getting through the metrics to ensure that we are obtaining the goals for a deib program that were established Initial work, you think of it maybe as the possible first phase that I just showed. In 2022, could be done with existing resources within administrative services. Those were around organization, forming of groups, really getting started doing some inventory and some things that are already in existence. But additional resources are needed to bulk up for the bulk of the DEIB program. And council should anticipate a budget package dedicated to the city's DEIB efforts in the upcoming budget process. And with that, I would take any questions that you might have. Great, thank you so much, Mark. Um, then if you'll stop sharing so we can see everybody. Uh, and council, I'll open it up for any questions. Working on it. <laughs> and Deputy Mayor Lamb. I just had a quick question. How many years do you see this roadmap? Oops, sorry. Oh, I'm not sure. Did you hear my question? I think you were asking about the number of years the roadmap would cover or would it take? That, that it would take. Well, I think the roadmap would cover multiple years and it's really a, a bit of an iterative process. So part of, part of the idea for having the metrics are assessing progress. Part of that will be, you know, initially gathering some data, seeing where employees in particular think that we are and then taking a look at what it would take to get there and then sustain and build on that. Typically you see them, you know, you see three-year maps, you see five-year roadmaps. I think within a couple of years, depending upon how we get started and the resources that we have, the, the framework for what we could call an actual program could be in existence. The, every item that might be listed on the roadmap or everything that we may want to do over time may not be accomplished, but the, um, the communication could be in place, the advisory groups could be in place, we likely would have worked through um, the outside expertise that we needed in order to get up and get going. And then over the course of time, it would just be about continuing to take a look at the metrics that we have in place to see if the strategies and the initiatives that were originally put in place are actually giving us the return that we are looking for. 
Um, just a follow-up question. Um, does this ladder up to an overarching strategic goal for the city? Like, do all the plans that we have, all the all this, the strategy basically behind this, um, does it ladder up to an overarching plan for the city? It, it certainly could. Um, you know, as I mentioned in, in the resolution, it has placing DEIB considerations um, right there at the forefront and taking a look at policy initiatives, budgeting, um, things of that sort. Mm -hmm. But honestly, that's going to be what part of developing the program and creating the roadmap is really all about. Um, so it certainly could be. You know, particularly if that's the input, I, I think, from council and, and the wishes. Um, I think it, it depends on what gets put together. Yeah. Again, the, the proposal here is that first initial step of, of really instructing the kickoff and the creation. And then entities like the um, employee advisory group, you know, some of the professional input for, for people that do this very successfully for jurisdictions will come in and help move that through. So it's hard to tell what it will really look like at this point since this is just getting to move it. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I guess that would just be my input that we look at it from an overarching perspective, that we have to take a look at it from a human resources perspective, but we also have to take a look at it from a policy perspective, et cetera. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Councilmember Howe? Uh, that's kind of along the point I was going to uh, poke around, I guess. I was at a BIRA 8 meeting, and it was clear that equity was the thing that, that everyone as part of that committee were really pursuing because access to natural resources is, a, is an equity issue. So um, what my question is is around um, the work that you're doing is is for internal employees. It will inform policy. Is it something that we can communicate outward? Because what I'd like to be able to do is I'd like to be able to be very transparent with our process and actually communicate that out to residents. Is that realistic or improbable? You certainly do see those things in other DEIB programs. So it's it absolutely is doable. And then I would say in the formation of a program going forward, if there's a strong interest in having that be a component of it, then that would be something that would be um, worked on as the full program were developed. Uh, because it's apparent to me that many cities are working on this right now and that we're in the throes yes. of it. So I'm not quite sure where we are in the, in the continuum because we're just starting, other cities are more adv advanced. Mm -hmm. However, um, every city is doing, every city <laughs> is engaged in this at some level. They are, and they're doing it a number of ways. So many have, again, done something legislative in order to really show the policy intent, and they've used whatever implements they tend to use in their jurisdiction, whether it's a resolution or an ordinance or a mayoral directive. Uh, many, many local Western Washington cities put together a type of advisory group. Some are internal, some are external, some become a mix over time where you've got some internal resources and some external resources that tend to drive it. Uh, many, many jurisdictions then really advertise that on their external website and lay out exactly what they're doing, highlight the fact that their legislative body you know, passed this particular piece of legislation. Here's the results of that. Here's what the city manager is doing. Here's what this group looks like. And so the, the communication part that I talked about is very much letting the community know, hey, this is really important to us. This is our policy statement. Here's what we're working on. And there's absolutely a component of that. You know, going back to those components of a successful DEIB program, the, the first three or four of those bullets were all about external facing things to include, you know, how the city uses its resources in order to reflect all of the components of DEIB. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Councilmember Stewart. 
Yeah, I, my questions are really along the same line, is that the, the way the resolution is written, it sounds much more like it's focused inward, um, and there are some dribbles and drabs of the how it makes sure that we're being, you know, inclusive and making everyone in the community feel that they belong. And so I just want to make sure that as we develop this roadmap, um, that it is certainly we want to make sure that our our employees, you know, that we have DEIB internally with staff and with our boards, but that we are also looking at how we become more inclusive in our decision-making processes, right? How do we have better outreach so that we're reaching the parts of the community that typically get left out of the decisions and may be most adversely impacted by decisions we make if we don't include them. And so I just want to make sure that there is a component of that in this plan and this roadmap to make sure we're doing just that. Our um, communicating out is is super important, but if we're communicating out on, you know, social media and social media is not something that there are, you know, potentially pockets of our community that tend to be on, how are we making sure we're we're getting that outreach and input from those parts of the community, whether it be seniors or or other aspects of the community. Um, I think we've seen tonight on several occasions that we have a lot of youth that want to be more engaged. And I can tell you that Facebook, um, from a youth perspective, is for old people, as I have been informed. So how are we making sure that we are engaging with our youth and hearing from them? Because uh, they are concerned and the decisions we make probably impact them more than anyone. So I just want to make sure that that's part of that roadmap and that it's a big part. It isn't just about the internal reflecting and communicating to the community. It shouldn't just be us talking at them. It should be us hearing from them as well. Please. Thanks. No, that's great input. And, and certainly it sounds like that's a valuable component now that a number of council members have mentioned it. Great. Yeah. Thank you so much, Mark. Really nice to meet you. Nice to meet you guys. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So, and I think Mark will be back next week or two weeks to bring the resolution. Yeah. So the, okay. the plan, uh, thank you, Mayor. The plan right now would be to bring it back on consent unless mm -hmm. you all would like to have a robust discussion about it in open session. We're happy to do that. I okay, think probably so that, we'll, we'll bring it back. Yeah, yeah cool. we'll bring it back in open session. And if there are specific um, components that you'd like to um, give us as suggestions, we're happy to roll those into proposed uh, changes to the resolution. Cool. So we get an email ahead of time yep. with that resolution. Yeah, please Perfect. go ahead and, and email us, and we will take that and we'll uh, roll it into a proposed uh, amended resolution when we get to that point. Cool. Great. Thank you so much. Okay, so last um, item, well, almost last item. Um, so overlay update, Klahani and 247th slash 246th. So Audrey, I believe, is coming back. Good evening, Mayor and Deputy Mayor and Council. Um, nice to see you again. This evening, we're just providing a very quick update on our um, planned 2022 overlay project within Klahani. Um, joining us this evening and providing that update is um, Doug Van Gelder, our city engineer, and Jim Gruber, our senior project engineer, and they'll be leading that discussion. So when they are ready, please um, take it away. Evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, Jim and I will discuss briefly, Jim mostly, uh, the update to our overlay project. Um, Jim, I'll let you take, take it from here and I will be supportive where I can. Sorry, Jim, we, Jim, can't, we can't hear you. Yeah. All right, Jim, I can, I can try my best to, to help out here then. Uh, basically, we're giving you an update with the uh, Kalani um, overlay. 
Uh, we're going to break, we're looking at breaking this project into two phases. Uh, specific, the main reason for that is the asphalt cost. Uh, the project will be broken into a concrete portion, which would, we're looking at having done this year, and then the overlay would be done uh, next year, would be included into the overlay projects for the following year. Um, main reason for that is the construction costs of the asphalt. Um, all the prices and the oil have gone up excessively. Uh, if we were to try to build everything this year, uh, we would be looking at coming back for an additional six hundred thousand dollars, approximately, to make uh, to make budget. Um, also, with how it's getting so late in the construction season. If we were to try to do the overlay this year, it would run into the school session. And that is one thing that we're trying real hard to prevent from happening. Um, and those are the main, the main points that we wanted to provide to you, let you know. So if people were asking why there was only concrete work being done in overlay, you'd, you'd have that information available. And Jim, I don't know if it works, if you can hear me now or not, if there's something that I missed, or should have gone further into detail, um, that would help. No, still no voice. Councilmember Stewart. Yeah, um, thanks for that. Um, I would say that uh, if the concern is scheduling because we don't want to interfere with school, that makes sense to me, but from a cost perspective, um, I can't imagine a scenario where anything's gonna cost less next year. So, um, you know, my recommendation would be if it's really a cost thing, it's probably gonna cost us a whole lot less to do it this year than it will next year. So is there any way to make it all work this year? Or again, if, the, if it's really a scheduling issue that I guess, you know, that's not something we can, we can deal with. When you say, is there a way to make it this work this year? There is, but we would have to get additional funds um, it's not within our budget at this point uh, to, to make it work. Right, and I guess my, my question would be, and maybe uh, Mr. Interim City Manager, this is kind of directed at you, but even in a normal year, I think construction uh, inflation is about eight or eight and a half percent. I can't even imagine how much it is now. So if it really is just, and I say just, but if it really is just a budgeting issue, um, would we be better off kind of making the change and paying for it this year and then saving even more next year. Can, can you guys hear me now? Yes. yes. <laughs> oh. uh, Zoom doesn't always cooperate with me. And so sometimes I struggle with it. Um, but Doug hit uh, the majority of the talking points. The only thing I would add is, is to, uh, I guess, Council Member Stewart's point with um, uh, cost and scheduling, the two different issues that we see. Uh, a, a, some of the cost increase is, is, in our, is in the concrete half of our work also. And it, it gets the project to the point where it's split almost 50-50 between asphalt work and concrete work. And those are two different contractors that have to do it. Uh, it when, when it's a split 50-50, it's, it's almost better to have those projects be uh, separate and, and, and go out. Um, I guess as essentially as separate contractors. Otherwise, you have the two contractors arguing over who should be the prime and, and who's who's responsible for the bulk of the work. Uh, the other part is um, scheduling. Uh, it, it's not only just that we would be impacting school. It, it's that all of the concrete work has to happen before the paving work can happen. And to get that concrete work done, we would be pushing into the wet weather and cold weather season, which is really bad, a bad time of year to be doing so much paving. So that's another reason to just postpone the asphalt work and, and roll it into next year's project. Okay, so it sounds like it's really much more of a scheduling issue, because I, I guess my overarching ask would be for budget issues like that, that we have those discussions, because I see costs going up rather rapidly. So where we can do it sooner rather than later, um, it actually costs us less generally. So, um, but I totally understand from a scheduling standpoint, we don't like to do major projects once school starts and once it gets rainy. So that's fair. Great, thank you. And this was informational, I believe, just giving us a heads up. So 
Um, does anyone else have a question or comment? Council Member Train? Yeah, just if you're going to do the concrete first and overlay second, which I have no problem with that, what uh, is what about like striping, the, the safety issues with striping then there? How, how does that work, Jim or Doug? Uh, well, for these two projects, it won't be an issue. Uh, the, the sidewalk work, um, one street, it doesn't have striping because it's a residential road. The other one is, is Klahani Boulevard and uh, our concrete work won't be getting out into the, the striping, the white fog lines and the yellow center lines. So it, it won't be an issue for that. Thank you. And any striping that did get damaged during construction would be repaired? On the contractor. Yes. Great. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Yeah, I think Thank that's you. all. Sorry okay. about my headset. <laughs> no, it's good. Thank you, Jim. All right, so next we have a closed session um, regarding collective bargaining, professional negotiations pursuant to RCW 42.30.144B. Um, so is 13 minutes? <laughs> I'm just looking at the clock. <laughs> or do we need to extend or? Uh, let's give it a whirl. Okay, 13 minutes. 10 p.m. What about 12? So 9.59, it's been coming to adjourn. I recommend that we extend the meeting now. We can always adjourn the meeting early, but if we don't extend the meeting now, we all have to come back out and make a motion to extend the meeting as opposed to just like having someone come out. five minutes? Let's just extend to 10.30. We don't have to use okay. it. Okay, you can go ahead. Make the motion. Okay, yeah. I move we extend the meeting to 10.30. Second. All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, 5-0 meeting has been extended to 10.30, and we are anticipating 15 minutes, so back at 10.04-ish from closed session. Great, thank you. All right, um, we are back, and next we have council reports. Uh, so Deputy Mayor Lamb. Um, I have a verbal one on June 29th. I met with the board of directors for Washington Realtors, Eddie Chang, and we discussed missing middle housing. And then on July 1st, council member Stewart and I met with other council members from Issaquah and Redmond to discuss and share projects and issues that our city is working on. Great, does anyone else have one? All right, then city manager. Uh, this is a very short one. I just wanna say thank you again to all the staff, volunteers, and community for joining us last night for the fireworks celebration. It was uh, just amazing to see the community out and all congregating and having the opportunity to do that uh, was, uh, for me, it was really special. So I just wanna say thank you to everybody who was involved in that. Madam Mayor, if I may, I just want to let you know, uh, you know, I work at Microsoft and I will tell you that more than one colleague this morning was talking about the Sammamish fireworks <laughs> at work. So um, well done. Yeah, as I said, I still can't hear because we're right underneath them, but they were incredible. So yeah, thank you all. Um, so I will mo entertain a motion to adjourn. Move we adjourn. Second. Second. All right, moved and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, 5-0. We are adjourned. Thank 10 you, everyone. 10-05. Nice. 10-05.